When did you realize you had artistic talent? Oh boy. I think the first drawing that I can remember doing was in kindergarten. And I think that the teacher just said, you know, draw something that you like. And um, even back then, I was obsessed with alligators, as I'm still today obsessed with alligators. But um, uh, I, re I can remember drawing a, an alligator with, you know, green crayons, whatever. And um, I don't remember what it looked like exactly, but I do remember that people made a fuss about it. Like, hey, wow, that's a really good drawing. And I didn't really think that much of it. Um, until it kept happening. People kept like, like I, I'd win a prize for my drawing, you know, like in, in second grade or whatever. And, and then people started to say, oh, you know, Frankie's gonna be an artist when he grows up. Frankie's gonna be an artist when he grows up. And like, okay, I'm gonna be an artist when I grow up. Um, until I hit that stage, that teenage years where I was like, you can't tell me what I'm gonna be. <laughs> I'm not gonna be an artist, I'm gonna be an actor, you know, whatever. But, uh, but early, that early on, like, however old you are in kindergarten, four or five, something like that. Who did you want to emulate as an actor? Oh boy. I wanted to be, uh, at different stages, I wanted to be David Hedison, who was the star of Voyage to the Bottom of, of the Sea and the movie The Lost World from 1960, Irwin Allen's version of The Lost World. And I wanted to be David Hedison because he got to do all these cool things. He got to fight dinosaurs, and he had to, you know, fight a giant spider, and he did, uh, you know, and he saved the girl, and all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, and so the, in the 1960s, there were a lot of movies, like Ray Harryhausen movies, where there was a, a you know, a good-looking hero who would fight monsters, and that was so appealing to me. So James Franciscus was another one that it was like, I'm, I'm going to be James Franciscus without a doubt, you know, <laughs> and fight, fight Tyrannosaurus Rexes in, in the middle of the desert. But, uh, uh, you know, I, every, so every, every few years I would find another actor that I sort of glammed on to and was like, that's who I'm going to be. And I would, like George Siegel for many years, I, uh, that was in like high, early high school. I, I just love George Siegel. And so I, I, he wore a lot of these Irish swe uh, sweaters, <laughs> right? So I, I wore those all the time. My, I had my hair styled the way he did and everything like that. But, uh, yeah, I, I was easily influenced <laughs> by, by my heroes. Where did you get the sweaters lip growing up in? Was it upstate New York? Or, oh, or? they weren't. They were just knockoffs. They weren't oh, the I real see. Irish sweaters, oh. but they looked like the ones that George wore. So that was good enough. And sorry, you did, you grew up in in uh, Long Island, right? Not yeah. I grew up um, I grew up on Long Island, um, which is off of uh, New York, um, uh, the North Shore of no of Long Island, which is. Part of the reason I don't have the Long Island accent, um, but that's also from comes from I think acting training as well. I oh. think you, mm -hmm. you you try to lose any any distinguishable act accent when you're 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 planning to do uh, to be an actor because you don't want to be pigeonholed and as someone who oh, who's only from this particular area, or whatever. Um, unless you're going to go on The Sopranos, and then right. you know, then it works in your favor, obviously. I was going to say, yeah, a lot of shows now it might actually work in your favor, <laughs> yeah. even if you're not from mm -hmm. the East Coast. Although, I mean, if you look at you look at The Walking Dead, half of that cast are from uh, Britain. You uh, I mean, you know, the governor and and Rick Grimes, the the, the lead, like they're they're uh, they're all from from England, so. But apparently, apparently, Southern is the easiest accent to learn if you're if you're from there. Oh, interesting. That's what they tell me. Hmm. How would you spend your time as a kid? Drawing. Yeah, um, drawing my own comic books, um, drawing monsters. So, one probably the very first movie that I ever saw when I was maybe six. Oh, this is the, at least that I can remember. This one stuck in my head. I was on my grandmother's house and, and you know, this gigantic TV, right? <laughs> Black and white TV. And Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Oh, wow. Was on. And I had never seen anything like that before. I was blown away by it. It was just the Wolfman and Dracula and Frankenstein. And I don't think I even saw it as a comedy at that age, you know, I saw it, I, these monsters fascinated me, I couldn't believe it, and from that point on, mostly what I drew were monsters. 
So I would draw the Wolfman, I would draw Frankenstein, anything at all. And then Aurora uh, was a model kit company in the 1960s, and they, uh, uh, they came out with these monster models. And that became an, an obsession also, was building these models and painting them and everything like that. But it was always, it was monsters. I just loved monsters. And then even as a teenager, were you not, so you didn't sort of want to become the next Paul McCartney, you, you wanted to draw or be an actor? Yeah. What yeah, music definitely. and yeah, all and that I, didn't I don't think that I was particularly skilled in social graces. <laughs> and this is very common with uh, what we've discovered with kids that, that uh, what we call monster kids now. Uh, kids who, <laughs> like kids who are obsessed with, you know, the old classic monster movies and so forth is that, um, especially back in the 60s and, you know, early 70s, there was no internet, there was a, you couldn't even, you know, you didn't even have VHS or anything like that. So when these movies came on television, it was an event. You know, you go, you go every week, run down to get the TV guide and flip through it and try to see if like, if there are any cool monster movies showing that week, right? But we, there weren't, there were usually only one or two kids in your school that had the similar interest. And so uh, it could be a, you know, kind of a, a lonely existence, actually. Um, and at least, at least because of your interest, um, that uh, you'd spend a lot of time by yourself. Um, if you were lucky, there was another kid that you, know, you befriended who also loved that stuff, and then you, could, you guys could draw together. You know? <laughs> and, or, or make you know, little Super 8 movies, which a lot of us did also. Um, but I, um, I, I think that, um, I think we spent a good deal of the time Drawing and um, and and cre creating is really maybe a better way to put it because it wasn't just drawing; it was sculpting things in clay and and uh, and writing up stories, uh, you know, writing writing scripts that we never would make, <laughs> but we we pictured making them quite a lot. I think that's probably common for a lot of movie fans, movie nerds, whatever. Back in the day, too, maybe except for now with the DSLRs, it seems like everybody is doing it, but back in the day you sort of found refuge in these movies and it was like a safe place and, and those who didn't fit in, you yeah. know, myself included, it was, it was you, this is, these were my people right here, you know, yeah. and I felt good and, and kind of you feel safe amongst the, the crowd in the movie theater or watching it on TV. Yeah, and when, when it got to the, uh, the early 70s, uh, the coolest thing happened, which was they started doing sci-fi conventions uh, in New York, Star Trek conventions. And, and I wasn't like a Trekkie or whatever you want to call them. I, it wasn't, um, I wasn't obsessed with Star Trek, but I liked it a lot. And the Star Trek conventions would be more than just Star Trek. It would be science fiction in general. So there would be, peop there would be guys selling movie posters and, and stills and slides and all kinds of stuff. That um, that I started to collect, uh, to uh, just basically plaster the walls of my room with. Right. Uh, yeah. So, but that also opened up the door to other people that were not in my town who had similar interests. So you might actually start a friendship, a, you know, a, a pen pals we called them back then. Yeah. Yeah. Where you're now writing to people that don't live in your town and comparing notes about movies and so forth. Oh, did you see? Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, yeah, you know, and talk about it. Sure, it's great. Yeah, I found horror conventions so some of the nicest people. Oh yeah. And you wouldn't, you'd oh, it's like you know, and they're like you know, they look like Marilyn Manson or something, and they're actually the the kindest people. Whether you go to the opera and <laughs> not so much. They're the real monsters. <laughs> oh, maybe I don't know. Growing up in New York. You said you grew up in Long Island, but in the which shore? North Shore. North Shore, okay. Did you dream about coming to Hollywood? Or? Oh. oh. I definitely dreamt of coming to Hollywood. Um, I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know what the reality of it was, anything like that. Um, uh, I just, you know, what you saw on how, how television portrayed Hollywood is what I thought Hollywood was. Like, you know, at the movie studio, you got a guy walking this way in a, in a, a suit of armor and a guy walking this way in a bunny <laughs> suit, you know, and they're like, hey, how are you, you know? Um, uh, I did not know the, uh, the amount of work involved uh, to get there. Um, and the, 
uh, the patience <laughs> and the thick skin you needed and all those kind of things. But, you know, like, like a, lot, a lot of kids, just you had a picture of what it was like and you were going to go there and make movies and, and be James Franciscus fighting a dinosaur or whatever. And, and so definitely dreamed of it. And so when I would make my own little Super 8 movies, I would almost always be the star of it, you know, um, be able to, I could fight a dinosaur in my Super 8 movie at least, right? Um, but it was so far away from where I lived. You know, I, and if you grow up here and you see movies being made all the time down the street, you know, you run into, you can run into movie stars at the grocery store, et cetera. But where I was living, there were a couple of movie stars who lived out at the tip of Long Island in an area called Sands Point that was rather lucrative. Oh, cool. um, but that actually leads me to, to my first brush with real Hollywood. Uh, I was 18, I think, at that point. Um, and again, I didn't really have, at that point I hadn't really thought about like going to Hollywood and be working on movies. Um, uh, it was a nice dream, but I hadn't, wasn't gonna pursue it any further than that. And my friend, Scott, his parents um, owned uh, Nina Shoes, which is a huge shoe company. Um, back then. I don't know if it's still around or not. But they had this mansion in Sands Point, this very, you know, exclusive area. And he called me up one day and he said, uh, hey, listen, they're shooting a movie at my parents' house. You want to come over and like check it out? They're like, yeah, sure. And I didn't know what the movie was. I get there and right off the bat, I had my <laughs> first experience of what it's like to be on a set because I got out of my car and I went up to somebody and I went to say, hey, do you know where Scott? And they turn around and like, shh. <laughs> right? Okay. And I didn't realize that, like, you really have to be quiet. You know, not just quiet, you have to be quiet. Right. So that was my first lesson, right? So I go, I go around to the back and I find Scott and a couple of my other friends were there. And they're shooting a scene in the, the, the back part of the house. And I look over and there's Robert De Niro and Jerry Lewis. And Martin Scorsese is sitting behind the camera. And they were shooting the King of Comedy there. Uh, a big scene, actually, in the film. Um, and I didn't know the plot, obviously. Um, I, I think they made, Scott maybe filled me in a little bit of what it was. But I, this, was, this blew my mind. I was like, oh, my God. Like, and I'm, then I'm looking around and seeing everything that's going into it, all the trucks and the generators and the lights and the cameras and the, you know, the people doing all these different things. You know? And um, I, was, I was just, it, it really just blew my mind. Um, I, 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 I felt like it was a dream, you know? And at one point they broke for lunch and everybody, so the whole set sort of cleared away and I, I walked in there by myself and there's this living room and it was set up with, uh, with pictures of Jerry Lewis with different people because it was supposed to be his house, right? And, and, I, saw, and, I, and I saw this sign that said, do not touch, hot set. And I was thinking that it meant that it was physically hot. <laughs> I was going to burn my hand if I put my hand on anything. <laughs> I would find out later that it just means, you know, that it's a working set. So you can't, you can't move anything or touch anything. But uh, it was an amazing experience. And I, then I definitely said, okay, this is a real thing. This is, this is something that you can do. How you get there, I'll, I'll figure that out somehow. You know? But uh, I, it was, it was eye-opening. Do you go back and watch that scene? Oh, yeah. Oh. I just watched it um, uh, maybe a couple of months ago again. And, yeah, and watching that scene in particular, uh, was well, just all the memories just come flooding back and thinking like, wow, this was this was a key moment. Like probably probably Albert, Adam Costello and B. Frankenstein was the first one. King of Comedy was the second one, for sure. When you moved out to Hollywood from New York, did you have a job lined up? Did you have friends that were able to help you get in the business? No, <laughs> I dragged my wife Leanne kicking and screaming to LA. And I went because I had at that point made the four horror movies in, in, up in Canada with John Fasano. 
And, um, but, and, th and then I was fully bitten by the bug at that point. I mean, I knew I was going to keep doing this, whatever it was, whether it was acting or if it was, I, I discovered that I liked writing during the course of making those, those films. So now John, he, if you'll pardon the expression, John had brass balls because he just picked up, he wrote a script and he picked up and he went to LA and he sold a script, like six figures, right off the bat to Morgan Creek. Oh, wow. Right? And it was like, holy crap. <laughs> like, he, it, he did it. Like, he came out here and, and they, uh, they never made that movie, by the way, but it did lead to him then writing another 48 hours and... Um, uh, uh, what was the other? He wrote many drafts of Alien Three. Um, he wrote a whole bunch of movies. Um, so I thought, well, John did it. I can do it. And at the time, I was working. I was working in the South Tower of the World Trade Center. Oh. Yeah. And I quit that job, mm. and said, to "Leanne, well, I have to go. I have to go to L.A." And she did not want to go, but she did. And. <laughs> We got out here, and there, our first place was this, uh, you know, renovated garage. <laughs> it was just, it was just awful. And I, 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 I had pictures, you know, I had my headshots, and, and I had two scripts with me that I had written. And then when I got out here, I discovered how difficult it was to get somebody to read your scripts, and also to to get a part. I mean, you know, as an actor. You're, I mean, that, that's, that would have been true in New York as well, but, but I think even more so out here is that, you know, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people who all want that part. And, uh, you know, if you, you, so there's a lot of rejection. What year was this? Sorry to interrupt. This, is, this was 1990. 1990, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. So pre-AOL, pre, pre -AOL, no, oh, yeah. no, no one was dialing up, nope. really, unless you were some... No, and I made somewhere. yeah, I made the, the <laughs> I made the rookie mistake, and a lot of a lot of aspiring screenwriters do this, but I'm, I fess up, I did it too. I took my script, I took the script I thought was the best one, and uh, made copies of them, and I put them in envelopes, and I sent them to every agency in town, and one by one, they all came back unopened with a stamp on it that basically said, we cannot accept unsolicited material uh, because it is a, uh, it's a legal liability. Oh, yeah. So all these scripts came back to me. It was like, I was so, uh, it was just, I started to wonder like, uh, did I make a mistake to move out here? And I was getting little jobs as, I worked as a PA on a couple of movies and, and did some extra work and so forth. And, and, and Leanne started to get work um, uh, as uh, a casting uh, associate. And she, she, so she, and she worked on some good, sh some cool shows and some good movies. She worked with Victoria Burroughs, who's a, like one of the biggest casting directors in town. And um, so, but, but, you know, we were struggling without a doubt. And uh, I was really starting to wonder, have I made a big mistake here? That I, I dragged my poor wife out here and it's not working. Yeah. And John, John was doing great, but he couldn't really help me. Um, there was well, only so why? much he could do. Well, yeah. Why do you think he couldn't? Because there's that misconception of like, oh, they won't help me. Or, you know, you, you don't want me. You know, they, can, is, can, there, can you dispel how I maybe it that, really works? I think with, well, with John, I, I think John would, would have been happy to help. But he had already reached this level up here, and it, it's kind of hard to bring somebody in at that sure. level. I mean, he was great. I mean, he, he, brought, he brought me to the set of another 48 hours, and I had lunch with Walter Hill and Nick Nolte and everything like that, and it was, it was cool, everything like that. And um, I, we did make a movie, um, a, a, a feature-length movie on Super 8 Sound that John actually paid for. Um, he gave us like ten thousand dollars, I think, and uh, we we made a, an entire movie, it's Super Eight Sound. It's never been released because it's Super Eight Sound. You can't can't get a, a real release of it. Um, but but the script was really good, and and I got you know some good actors. I directed it and and got some really good actors to be in it. You know for for free, and um, and John paid for it. He never came to the set. He just, he just gave us the money and, and go for it. And, and 
was happy with it at the end. Although one thing that is funny is that like, like so often happens with independent horror movies, uh, when the movie was finished and showed it to John, he came back and he said, you need to do some reshoots. I need more nudity and more, more blood. <laughs> And we did. We, so we did. So you reshot? Yeah, we, we just we just did some pickup. We did, we shot a, a, a whole new um, title sequence that had a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, topless women and uh, tar and tarantulas uh, crawling on. <laughs> so that was creepy. In no but, particular you know, order. Yeah. You know, <laughs> no, it was just sort of this visionary kind of thing, right? Um, well, speaking of independent horror, you were in the 1988 horror film. Is it Black Roses? Black Roses. And it's premises like this heavy metal band comes to this conservative town and warps all the teenagers minds yeah so you had been through you had already experienced something like that where oh sure you, they needed to sort of up the 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 viewability with yeah, exactly know. the the investors for for that movie um and, and i think maybe even for rock and roll nightmare one of the other movies we had done up in canada um, we came back and it was, it was like, yeah, we need more more naked women and and more monsters or more gore or whatever, just to just to pump it up and be able to sell it on a market in the 1980s. That was basically that's what horror movies were. Sure, sure. You no, know, they were there. That was the time of the Friday the 13th movies and so forth. So, you know, sex and blood and rock and roll were all you know things that. Uh, you needed, yet it was a ticking off the boxes, if yeah. you will, you know. That's why people went to the movies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, but yeah, John, John could only do so much, basically, and I understood that, you know. And I, and I did not expect, to, you know, to come out here and have him, you know, hold my hand and, and, th and give me things for, you know, for free or whatever, not for free, so what I mean, but, you know, yeah, he introduced me to Charlton Heston, that was, wow. that was enough for me. Yeah, that's, <laughs> well, it most... Yeah, most people don't get that. That's yeah, pretty good. absolutely. That's good no, that was a big thrill because I was a gigantic. I still am. I'm glad that John wasn't able to um, help me that much, you know. Um, aside from introducing me to some people and so forth, and, and making that little movie that we called Spider Bite, the, the Super Eight Sound movie, um, because I think that um, I think you have to earn it yourself. I mean, I I, I believe that. Uh, these days, it's really it's a lot easier to to sort of work your way into the business because, you know, you can you can buy a credit. You can you, you know what I mean. Like you can you can go to a Kickstarter campaign and they're making a movie, and you can buy, buy a credit. You can buy you can buy uh, an associate producer credit or whatever. You know what I mean? And build up your resume that way. You know, we didn't have that. I don't I, I don't blame anybody for doing that, but I'm saying that we never had that luxury. We everything that we had to do, we had to really do it ourselves, earn it, uh, to work our way up up the ladder, if you want to call it the ladder, you know, to to achieve what we wanted to achieve. Do you ever um, not correct someone, but give them maybe Big Brother advice on that same mindset? Because I think it, it even though social media is great because you can speak to so many people and if you're active in one cause you might end up tweeting a celebrity or something mm -hmm. or, or somebody of, of, of note that could maybe help you but there's still that idea where I can still like just I can access all this and just jump over all the hurdles do you ever like dispel that myth for for people <laughs> yeah I I, I I do um, people don't always listen <laughs> but, um, do, but you do say something. Uh, yeah, I do. I do. And, what do you say? And I've said. I've said. I'm a friend recently that I said said it to. I said, you know. Um, I I think these these are mistakes. These are your mistakes to 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 make. You know what I mean? Like like, I can tell you something, and you can listen to me, or you can not listen to me. Whatever. Either way. You're gonna you're gonna you're, you're gonna you're gonna make you're gonna make your own mistakes basically is what i meant and and sometimes that's a good thing it's how you learn sure but even coming here in 1990 there was no youtube mm -hmm. you couldn't do a web series you couldn't do a kickstarter indiegogo seed and spark you, you had to really have someone endorse you it was just exactly. a totally different ball game then oh sure and and in fact getting an agent which has forever been the, the catch-22 you know, you can't um, you can't get a, 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 a you can't get a movie unless you have an agent. 
but you know, you can't get an agent unless you've had a movie. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, that's as old as the hills. Um, and it's still kind of true. Um, the only difference is now because of platforms like YouTube and so forth where people can show off their creativity and it's, it's a lot easier to get it seen. And we made that little spider bite movie with the hopes that we could show it to, you know, people and get them interested in, in you know, either the actors or myself as a writer or as a director or whatever, um, it was something that we could show. And that's, you know, that's what you, that's, that's all you could do back then uh, is have something to show. And it, the trick was, how do you get it to them? And then like nowadays, put it on your website, put it on YouTube, put it, you know, wherever. And um, you can just direct people toward it, which is great. I'm not knocking it at all. No, no. Saying it's yeah. that, you know, back then it was, um, I sound like, a, like an old geezer. Back then we had to walk through 50 miles of snow. Um, well, the 90s wasn't that long ago and, and in terms of to some technology. I mean, I realized, fast. you know, data was the new thing that was coming. You know, it was going to yeah. be so great. <laughs> I, yeah, and, and, you know, I remember my first computer, which was, you know, uh, I think my first computer was probably right before I moved out here. But then AOL came along, and then all of a sudden now, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're talking to, to lots of people, not just the ones that you might meet uh, at a party or the kids you grew up with or whatever. Like, now it's, it's huge. And um, I, I, a lot of my friends that I still hold dearly today are, are people that I, that I met talking about monsters on the internet and comparing notes about like, how, how miserable is it that we can't get anyone to look at our scripts? <laughs> did you think about driving back home? I did. Um, I definitely did, especially when um, I couldn't get anyone to look at, look at the scripts, right? And so this was an interesting story. So uh, my wife was doing some casting work at um, uh, a production company called Kushner Lock, which I don't think they're in business anymore. But they were down in Santa Monica, and um, we only had one car, so every morning I would drive her down there from, from North Hollywood and drive back, and then at the end of the day, drive back down again. And but so that was, was basically fun. spending six, hour, <laughs> six hours in the car every single day. <laughs> and... Um, but she was working there um, on casting, um, I think it was like the HBO show First in 10, I think, which was, well, I think, their first, HBO's first series, right? I think it had OJ in it, actually. Um, and, uh, uh, but there were other offices there on that floor of, of um, the Kushner Lock floor. And, uh, and sometimes I would go there. I was, I was writing spec scripts for the show that they were producing called Sweating Bullets. And um, I was showing them to, um, uh, to uh, who was it, Peter Locke, I think, was, uh, was the Locke of Kushner Locke. And, um, uh, you know, there was always something wrong with them one way or another. Like, I, I wrote one that was, had voodoo element to it. And right off the bat, he just goes, he's, he's like, oh, we're not allowed to, you know, the, the, the network doesn't want any voodoo. Oh, and I'm like, no. oh, great, right? <laughs> So, but anyway, so Except I kept trying, Louisiana. kept it's trying, okay. and he, because he, he, he said the writing was, was, was okay, it's like, well, it was just the, more, more often it was the, um, uh, the subject material that, that he couldn't work with. But anyway, so one day I was there, and Leanne goes, oh, I want you to meet um, a, a really cool guy. And takes me down the hallway to this little office, and inside is this, this gentleman, and um, she says, Bill, I want you to, this is my husband, Frank, and, uh, and he says, hi, uh, William Asher. And I realize who it is. And um, for those who don't know, William Asher is a, was a legendary producer, director. He, um, he directed almost all the episodes of I Love Lucy. He, cre he, wrote the, um, he created the, um, the show Bewitched with his wife at the time, Elizabeth Montgomery. Uh, he, he directed all those beach blanket movies with Frankie and Annette and so forth. So, I mean, the man really was a legend. And there I am now talking to him, and he was a lovely man. And I sat down with him, and, and we started, you know, just chatting. And I started to tell him my tale of woe that I couldn't get anybody to read my scripts. So he goes, oh, I'll read your scripts. I'm like, oh, cool, all right, right? And uh, 
<laughs> so he took them, and a, a few days later, um, I was back there again, and he called me in his office and sat me down. And he said, he goes, okay. So he said, so this one, he goes, ah. he goes, it was, it's okay. It was, it, the writing's okay. He goes, it, but it has a supernatural element, and I spent 10 years producing a show about magic, so I'm kind of like done with that. So it was that part of it he didn't care for. But he said, but this one, he said, this one, this is great. He goes, this is a great script. He goes, you did a great job. Characters are good. The story works. It's really good. He said, don't give up. He said, don't, don't move back to New York or whatever. He goes, if, if this is a real sample of what you can do, you will get an agent. You will, you will get work, right? And that was so inspiring to me. I was just like, that was, that was the encouragement that I needed right at that moment to come from somebody of, of his pedigree, right? Super nice man. So, um, so I didn't leave, stayed, and he was right. Within four, four or five months from then, I got my first agent. I had my first movie sale um, very shortly after that. Oh, wow. Had made about, f I wrote, I got hired to write a lot of scripts, but um, maybe five of them got made. But that's still good. <laughs> that's still a very good ratio. <laughs> um, so, but here's where the story gets very interesting, okay? We're gonna flash forward now like 20 years, right? A few, just a couple of years ago, my, um, my co-writer and producing partner, Todd Trina, and I meet for, go to meet um, uh, at, you know, Chateau Marmont, for, <laughs> right? And uh, do a Hollywood there. stuff, yeah, okay. right? You know. Which is your yeah. table, by the way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we were meeting about another project entirely, but as we're leaving, Todd says, oh, um, we, have, um, we actually have some movement on I Hate Kids, which was a script that he and I had, had co-written. And I'm like, oh, cool. I'm like, so what's going on? He goes, he goes. Well, we have an investor. We've already got like a you know a, some like a million dollars uh, you know invested. He goes, I'm going to be working on getting more. And he says, and we have a director. I'm like, really? Who who is that? He said, his, his name is John Asher. I just went, John Mallory Asher. And he goes, oh, I don't know his middle name. I was like, <laughs> was he a child actor? Was he on Weird Science? He was like, I I, I don't know. And I realize, of course, this is the son of the man wow. who encouraged me to stay wow. 20 years earlier. How interesting. And John Asher, I, I met with John Asher and, uh, and told him that story and he flipped out. He was like, holy cow. Um, uh, he couldn't believe it. And, but I knew it right at that moment that that movie was gonna get made. Because that that kind of synchronicity is just you can't you can't deny it you know what I mean like and uh, and the movie was made yeah and we want to talk about more and your mm -hmm. in your partnership with Todd in a little bit but I just was curious with the first script that you sold mm -hmm. how many scripts do you think you had actually written before whether they were in a drawer or whatever before you actually um, sold one uh, feature probably length. not many. Not many. Um, I had I had the two that I that I came out here with, um, and those were full length. They yeah, were yeah, they were okay. features, mm -hmm. um, and probably maybe just two or three more um, before. Um, you know, my 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 agent or uh, manager uh, at that time had read the one that 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 um, um, William Asher had said was good, and based on that, it, she took me on as a client. On that script, that, you know that's, and of course that movie's never been made. But every, but everything that I, you know, the success I've had ever since then is because of that script. Right. Yeah. Right. And and just briefly, what what was the script that you actually sold? Like what what did it entail? Oh, it was um, uh, it was called Return of the Gargoyle, and um, <laughs> because um, because I was friends with Adam West because we had made Zombie Nightmare together. Um, and the, uh, the, the Michael Keaton uh, Batman movie had recently come out, or not that long ago, but, but you know, this new improved version of Batman with these muscles and all this stuff, right, had come out. And 
So I, I came up with this, this funny idea that um, uh, the story would be about a guy who used to play a superhero on TV, who was now sort of washed up and was divorced from his wife and miserable. And, and this new version of his old character comes out and now he's really feeling awful. And uh, he, one night he, he's, he's ready to jump off a bridge when he suddenly hears somebody being mugged and he runs into the alley and he saves this person and he snaps basically <laughs> he starts so he starts putting on his old costume and going out and trying to fight crime for real oh. and he, you know he gets uh, shit kicked out of him <laughs> and, and you know and uh and all these other things happen but um there's a detective who's trying to figure out who who he is and all that kind of stuff so it was it was really it was a little bit of, of a love letter to adam and um uh, but it was my it was it was the first comedy that i had written um, the other ones before that were were more um, um, more sci-fi-ish kind of stuff, and uh, you know, Die Hard in a zoo or something like that. I don't know. I mean, everybody was writing a Die Hard movie back then. Um, but um, uh, but everybody who read that script really enjoyed it, and I would so I would get work from that script, even though that script uh, was never made. The vigilante yeah. superhero. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Adam. Adam read it. Um, I gave it to Adam and his Adam's uh, agent, um, and uh, they uh, they loved it. Uh, and Adam was willing to, you know, he was like, "Well, if you can get a mod modest budget, you know," he goes, "I'd I'd love to do it. It'd be fun." But you know, that wasn't that wasn't meant to be. So, if you knew that it would have taken you that long to sell one, do you think you would have still come out? Because you you saw your friend John, who. Mm -hmm was just like, you know, he got these green lights and angels were singing for him. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, and, and so you thought, well, then I can do this too. Do you, do you think you would have still stayed back in New York? I hope not. Because if I had not left that job <laughs> in True. the World Trade Center, things would be very different. Sure. Um, but, um, I, you know what, I was, I was so bitten by the bug, uh, probably. Probably still would have yeah. done it, yeah. Yeah, I think so. What's the closest you've come to moving back home? Probably just early, very early on. Um, I'm, there are parts of New York I certainly miss. Um, uh, I still have some family there, and, and I love seasons. Um, but um, I really haven't looked back since things started to you know, go my way. I have a quote here. Um, always have to have one quote in every interview. Yeah. So. Always ask yourself, is this going to help me get to my goal or not? And I believe that's from Bob Proctor. Mm -hmm. Do you do you have a certain set of guidelines you, you work from? Like, is, are there, is there a quote? Is there a mantra? Is there something that guides you? Hmm. Do, do you do you subscribe to this? You know, do you look at something and say? Am I doing this for the right reasons? Am I doing this for fun? Is this going to help me get to my goal? You know, I think earlier on, I was much quicker to just take whatever came along or to work for <laughs> exposure, <laughs> work on spec, and, and um, <clears throat> because I needed to, you know, build up uh, a reputation of some kind. Um, as far as a mantra, though, um, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I know that I can, I can listen to the pitch of a of an idea that if someone is looking to hire me, right? I can hear what their basic idea is, and I will know almost immediate, almost immediately, if I'm the right person for that job. Um, I, I, I can, I can, I, sometimes I've broken my own rules, but everybody breaks their own rules every once in a while. Um, but usually, cause what will usually happen is, is that, um, uh, I'll, my, my agent would send me in, I'd sit down with the producer or, um, the, who, the director, and they might already have a script. They might not, um, they might just have an idea. But I can I can usually tell very quickly um, if 
if I'm going to be able to bring anything to this project, if I'm going to be able to make it what it is they want it to be. Um, so, uh, and usually, what's very funny is usually if I don't think, I don't say it right away, right? I don't, I don't tell them that, that whether or not I think I'm the right person, not right away. But most of the time, if I don't think I'm the right person, I don't get the gig anyway. So, um, uh, I, I don't know if I have like any kind of quote or something that sticks with me. Um, uh, aside from, from William Asher saying, don't give up. And you can still see his face? Oh, sure. Yeah. Wow. That's a really, really interesting story. Just the whole <laughs> chain and that, yeah. his son. And that's really fascinating. Yeah. And then it was, what was funny also about that is that, um, our first meeting when I first met his son, John and, and the, and the producers of I hate kids around the table and they're all talking and everything like that. And, and somebody mentions John Landis. And I admit, I knew John because he was in my first, the first documentary on it. And I'm like, why, what about John Landis? And they go, oh, he's the executive producer of this movie. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, this movie is definitely getting made. Sure. <laughs> sure. And that was your King Kong documentary or? Uh, no, John was, uh, John was in Beast Wishes, the first oh, one okay. about Bob and Kathy Burns. Yeah. So you've come out to LA armed with scripts and are you also auditioning too? Yes. And you know you have this other talent which is to draw. Mm -hmm. um, how soon before you say, well, I'm going to try to utilize that to make a living and, and fulfill my artistic? Well, here's the thing. I always believe that when an opportunity arises, take it. Um, and. What happened was, I, I, I mentioned earlier that, that my wife Leanne was, was in casting and um, she had gotten a job at Walt Disney Feature Animation in the casting department. I think they were, I think they were working on Hunchback um, at the time. And, um, and she had been there for a few months and, and she was really liking working there. And just by being there, she met the people in the animation department and the producers of the animated shows and so forth. And she got to see basically how things work there. And she, she act, I remember her calling me up from work one day and saying, you know, you could do this. Like you could definitely do this. And I was like, well, I guess, but you know, I'm not, I don't know anything about animation. I, I didn't except for animating little clay figures, you know, for super eight movies. Um, but she she said, well, you should you should you know find out because you could get a job here. Like they're looking for people because, you know, um, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg had was just opening up um, uh, DreamWorks down the street and was grabbing up lots of animators, you know, and poaching them from Disney to you know to, to stock up you know his his studio. So everybody was looking for animators. So I was like, okay, well, I'll I'll go and take a class, I guess. So I went to the animation um, union and I started taking classes there in a hurry. <laughs> I was taking as many as I could, right? And even though, because, because even though I was, act, I was working, I was a working screenwriter, you know, a working screenwriter cannot work for a year sometimes, right? And so it was feast or famine most of the time. And I'm, I was still, I was, when I sold a script, it was really good money, but then it might be a long time before I sold another one. I mean, at least, at least one that got made. Um, uh, you know, you get paid something for, for writing it, but you get a lot of money if the movie gets made. For that, we call it the first day of principal check, which is <laughs> really nice. Um, so I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice though to, because I'd, now I'd been writing for you know, a few years, wouldn't it be nice to have like an actual steady job, steady paycheck for a while? So, so I went and I learned, I learned about animation really fast, right? Took all these classes, these, uh, I learned how to, uh, what kind of a portfolio to submit um, because uh, that's, that's, that's where a lot of people go wrong uh, when, when trying to get a job, back then at least, uh, trying to get a job in animation, is they, they would turn in a, a portfolio filled with drawings of Mickey Mouse and Goofy. 
And that was the last thing that uh, Disney Animation wanted to see. They wanted to see that you could draw, that you could draw human figures, that you could do life drawing, gesture drawing, you know, real artwork, not just traced cartoons, right? So, so I did, I put together a portfolio and I submitted it and I, and I got in. So that was good. It was, it, in fact, it was great. I started working on Hercules like almost immediately. Uh, that was the good side. The bad side was I had to tell my manager that I could not do any, I couldn't take any writing gigs. Because once you're under the umbrella of a corporation like that, the Walt Disney Company is a very big umbrella. They have, you know, they have music departments and they have, you know, obviously they make movies also. And so if you are a full-time employee, um, and this is not just Disney, by the way, this is all sure. studios mm -hmm. do this. If you're under their employee, you cannot work for a, a you know, competition. So if you write a script while you are working for them, technically they own it. And the kind of hoops that you have to go through to get it cleared so that you can take it somewhere else is just, it would, it would take months, right? So I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't be a writer for hire for anywhere, anywhere else. Um, they didn't look, Disney didn't look at me as a writer, they looked at me as an artist. But it didn't matter. Uh, same thing, with, you know, other artists I was working for who, who created their own music, Disney owned it as long as it was written and, and put out, you know, while working for them. Um, and it's a way to protect themselves, I get it. That's, uh, I, that di it didn't bother me. But I think my, my manager at the time was not very happy <laughs> about it because I was, I, was, I was working. I was bringing in, you know, uh, bringing in, uh, she was getting me jobs, so. Um, so that was the downside of it, for sure. But I, I loved it. I, I like working on Hercules it was the first one, and, and they were already well into the production of Hercules by the time uh, that I got in there. <laughs> by the way, also, I, I think I was in my mid thirties at the time, right? All the other people who came in with me in that group that, that of, of, of trainees. They were all fresh out of uh, Cal Arts, <laughs> so they were all like, you know, 21, you know, whatever. I was like the old man of the group, <laughs> so it was like, it, it just it seemed kind of weird, but I didn't care. I was, I was just so happy to be working there and to be working on that level of entertainment, you know. A, big movie that's going to, everybody's going to see it. And um, even, you know, even though I'm a small part of a much bigger team, um, you know, I'd still be part of it. And I could still look at scenes and go, ah, I did that scene. That's cool. Yeah. And so, um, so I stayed um, until the job became obsolete, basically. How did it become obsolete? Because, uh, because of Pixar, because the Pixar movies were, making a lot of money and the hand-drawn movies at Disney were not living, uh, living up to expectation. I think that the, um, the powers that be kind of look equated CG movies make money, hand-drawn movies don't. And the, that's, that wasn't true. But from a money-making point of view, I'm, I'm sure that's what they thought. The truth is the, the scripts weren't as good as the ones that Pixar was putting out. And it always starts with the script. I mean, you could have made Finding Nemo hand-drawn and it would still be just as good. It would it'd be the same movie. It would just look a little different. It would still be a fantastic movie. You know, The Lion King would still be, you know, a terrific movie if it was done hand-drawn. Oh, wait, wait, Lion King was done hand-drawn. Um, I, I was up there saying, like, well, the Lion King would be just as good if you did it in CG. I know, it's, make, I know it's making a lot of money. I haven't seen it yet. Though. But, you know, the point is that sure. it, was, it, was, it was just that the, the scripts weren't catching the eye of the public. Um, it was either the wrong demographic that they were looking at, because they were doing, they were experimenting a little bit, they, like movies like Atlantis. Uh, and Treasure Planet 
which were not, you know, Disney princess movies. Um, so, and I, I admired the fact that they were trying to branch out and see, but it, it, those movies just did not um, live up to their potential. And sorry, what year was this when they kind of made this shift? When they uh, decided I, to... Uh, well, I started on Hercules in 1996. So I had been screenwriting for three or four years. Um, before that. Right, but when Disney decided to go away from the oh, hands oh, oh. on. So that happened early 2000s. Um, um, I think that the last, the last movie I worked on was called Home on the Range. And I think that that came out in 2003, I want to say, somewhere around there. So it was, it was the early part of the 2000s that Somewhere or right around there, they made the decision that, that Home on the Range would be the last um, hand-drawn film. How much talk before, had, had, had it been years of build-up to that point? Did you not, hear that in the air? Y yes, but not a lot of years. I can really, I mean, I, some of us could see the writing on the wall and others refused to believe it. Um, I can remember saying to somebody at one point, maybe it was while we were making Tarzan, and they were starting to use, they were really starting to utilize um, CG elements into the 2D movies, and and of course the Pixar movies were already doing great, you know, Bugs Life and so forth were doing really well, um, and I remember saying to one of my colleagues there, I said, you know, I think ten years from now they're all going to be CG, and I, the person I was talking to, and I don't remember who it was, but it was just like no way. That's, there's no way that's not possible. And um, it turns out I was wrong. It, it only took five years. Wow. So it happened pretty, pretty quickly. So, I mean, even by the last movie, by Home on the Range, by that time, you know, we had all been told this was the last one. Um, and it was, that was not a good time. I mean, yeah. that, last, that last year, um, was, was it, morale was very low. And, um, uh, you know, it's kind of... Some of those people, like I said, you know, these kids had come straight out of Cal Arts, right? Well, they, you know, they had just done that recently, but there were people who were working at that company for 40 years who never had another kind of job. Yeah. You know, they never even worked fast food or whatever. They came right out of Cal Arts, you know, because Cal Arts was created to basically groom Disney artists. They they went right to work and they were there their whole their whole existence and and now all of a sudden they're you know they're in their fifties and and their job is gone and it's not like you could even go to another studio all the studios were doing it um, so that was a you know it was a big transition for a lot of people now um, I, I don't I don't blame Disney at all I mean I think it's it's evolution um, in a way I mean this is this is what happens. Um, with all kinds of art, I think. Um, but uh, I felt bad for a lot of people who did not, you know, know what to do. They, you know, people buy expensive houses and expensive cars and everything like that when things are going great. And uh, mm -hmm. that's why when occasionally um, I, I go back to my college um, in New York to, uh, to just be a guest speaker and things like that and talk to people about animation or acting or filmmaking in general, screenwriting. And one of the things I always tell them is, um, uh, you know, pursue your dreams for sure, but have a backup plan <laughs> because you never know when the, the rug can be pulled out from under you. Like we never imagined that, uh, I thought I was gonna work for Disney forever, you know? And then all of a sudden, boop, <laughs> it ended. Um, and and I could have I could have tried to learn CG and Disney was great in that regard because they actually offered us free classes to, to learn it and I took advantage of that I I, I took the classes and learned the, the uh, Maya um, CG program but I couldn't I couldn't find the joy in it it's a big difference now nowadays it's a, it's easier because now they have Wacom tablets where you can you can draw right on the screen so it's you're drawing again but back then the difference between drawing the, the tactile difference between drawing with a pencil and moving a mouse and clicking a mouse very very different things and 
that wasn't for me. What did some of those people end up doing? I mean, their whole identity was disrupted. This was who they were. Yeah, uh, and a lot of people, it's how they define themselves. So suddenly you have to find something new to do. I mean, I, you know, look, I saw people that I knew that were pulling down, you know, nice, nice fat paychecks every week at Disney who were then working at Trader Joe's. And there's nothing wrong with working at Trader Joe's, but my point is that it was the, the, the difference in the, the amount of money that you're bringing in is substantial. And it's because that's all they knew. And sure. if, there's, if, there, if there wasn't any animation work anymore, what are you gonna do? You gotta find some other way to make money. And I, people did all kinds of things. Some people moved away and I don't know what they did. And um, some people started uh, working on um, uh, doing storyboards for live action movies. And um, some of my friends who came in with me in that training class um, uh, ended up directing TV shows for Disney and, uh, and or writing for TV shows for Disney and so forth. So. Some of us found our way. <laughs> right, so they, so they offered you these free classes. Mm -hmm. you, you used the, is the program called Maya, you said? Yeah. Maya, back, okay, back then. That was, that was the, the main program that mm -hmm. they used for CG back then. And you just knew pretty much instantly, this is not gonna be for me. <sighs> not instantly. It took, it took a couple of months before I was just like, oh, I, my brain isn't wired for that. Um, I my you know that there's that that tactile thing where you're holding a pencil between your fingers and you know the these it's running up here and then running back down again and and I got nothing from moving that mass, mouse around there was nothing that, that wasn't happening and and I was just like well maybe um maybe I can go back to screenwriting <laughs> um and you know there were, every once in a while, there would be a special project that came up that needed 2D. Uh, my wife um, helped produce um, a series of um, uh, educational films that had Timon and Pumbaa from The Lion King. And they did those in 2D, and I got to work on those. And, and every once in a while, something pops up. I mean, just last year, um, um, uh, I got hired to work on Mary Poppins Returns and got to uh, you know, work on animating the, the penguins that you know, dance with Lin-Manuel Miranda and uh, um, uh, Emily Blunt. <laughs> and that was really cool. That sounds cool. <laughs> it was really cool. Um, because that scene in the original movie with Dick Van Dyke was my favorite scene in the whole movie. So, yes. um, so it stuff do does come up, but it's obviously it's, you know, CG is, is really the, is the leading technology for doing animation now. There's talk, I hear rumors, they, Disney might go back to doing some 2D movies. They did do Princess and the, um, and the Frog a few years after Home on the Range, um, I, which I didn't work on the movie itself. I did work on some of the sort of commercials for it. Um, but uh, but um, I've heard, I hear these rumblings and you never know if, if they're rumors, if they're true or not, but they said that there, there might be some consideration of returning to to 2D for, for certain projects. And, certain movies. and then you gave your two weeks notice or oh, there no, wasn't no. a two weeks notice? You were, you were given two weeks. They gave me, <laughs> they gave me like a two month notice. Uh, okay, <laughs> like a I severance did. or something. And you, then you got a call. So you knew this date was coming, that oh, yeah. you would be out of a job. Yeah, and then they did it in waves. They did oh, they it did, as, okay. As, okay. as we got further along on Home on the Range, they, they would let a certain amount of people go, and then um, you know, a few months later, a certain amount of people go, and so forth. I I, I managed to hang on right to the very end. And this um, is in two thousand six. No, earlier, earlier. Earlier. Okay. I think it was. I think it was two thousand. I think it was two thousand and three. Actually. Okay, so the economy is doing decent, so it's not like they're letting you go in two thousand nine. Right. You're, you're. And then, as luck would have it, your phone rings. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right around that time. I mean, it was like within a week. Uh, I, out of the blue, I get a call from Todd Trina, um, who I had worked with uh, on a, a great script many years before um, called Woodstuck that um, still hasn't never been made, but it was, it was again, a, a script that helped me get other work. Um, uh, and I really liked Todd um, when we were working on that back then. Really, we, de we definitely got along really well and everything like that. And 
And it just so happened that right around the time the Disney gig was ending, Todd called me up and, and said, hey, are you available? I have an idea for a script I'd love you to work on uh, with me. And uh, I was like, oh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> your timing is perfect. <laughs> so uh, so I, I started working with Todd on a script uh, that we called um, Without a Hitch at that, at that time, which was Todd, Todd's a great idea guy. He would come up with a great concept for a movie, and then um, we would... We would bash out ideas, you know, over, over drinks often, <laughs> and uh, and then and then basically he would send me off to 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 write a first draft, and uh, and then I'd bring it back to him and we'd talk it all over and we'd come up with new ideas and and you know then work on a second draft and so forth and so forth and so forth as as long as many drafts as it needs to um, before it's ready to 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 put out there. And Todd has his own production company, or yes. he's been a producer. And forgive me, how did you two meet again? Um, basically, Todd was um, uh, was helping bankroll a a, a small, in, very small, independent um, group of uh, one filmmaker, basically. Um, and this was the guy who had hired me to write this script that that was called Woodstock. And so, so I met Todd through the director of. Um, who, the guy who was going to be the director of Woodstock. And um, like I said, we just, I, I, I liked him immediately. So you stayed in touch. He's in the San Francisco Bay Area. He would, no, he was still at that oh. time. He's up there now. Oh, um, his okay. family is all up there. But uh, he, was, he was actually living, living down here. Um, and, uh, you know, we'd, we'd meet up occasionally and, you know, go out and have a, have a dinner or something like that. But, but then we started really working together uh, on, on this script that he had this idea for. And uh, it's a, uh, it was a, a long time. Uh, uh, we'd work on it for a few months, and, and then you know other things would happen. And then a year later, we'd come back and work on it again, and some fresh idea would show up or something like that. So, um, and uh, uh, we just have a very good working relationship. Yeah. And so you've known each other like a good amount of time, ten yeah. plus years. Yeah, sometimes. since mm -hmm. since the early '90s. And so the one idea that he called you about has now turned into the movie that's already out, which yeah. is I Hate Kids. I Hate Kids. I Hate Kids, yeah. okay. Without a hitch. <laughs> we, we, we'd, we had done all kinds of drafts on, on, uh, on Without a Hitch. Um, and, uh, you know, adding characters, changing characters, changing endings, changing beginnings, you know, everything um, to, to get it what we felt was right. Um, and, uh, we were, I think we were, we were right on the verge. I, like we, we knew we were getting really close and I said, well, maybe we need a fresh title to sort of, you know, just spark, hit that spark plug again. Right. And, um, originally the, the lead character in, I, in, in, without, in without a hitch was, uh, the, uh, Nick was um, he was a uh, he was a guy who owned a big surfing um, company like surfing clothes and clothes and so forth right and somehow it just I don't know it wasn't really gelling and I said what if he was because he because the character wasn't wasn't didn't have a lot of humor to him and I thought well what if we gave him an occupation where humor was part of his job. I said, "What if he's a, what if he's a writer? What if he's a, a guy who writes funny books? I know observational humor, kind of thing." And that really that that fire took off without a doubt. And uh, I think we I think we made him British for a while too. We we were like, um, um, uh, who were we basing it on? Hugh. Like Hugh. Oh, Hugh Grant. Uh, uh, Hugh Grant. Yeah. You know. Because, because, because I, I remember that uh, Todd loves about a boy, that movie about a boy. So, um, but, but, but the writing, having the character be a writer, being a, be a being a, a, a humorist, definitely helped us gel that character. And, uh, and so I thought, well, he doesn't. We know he doesn't like children, and and his he's marrying someone who doesn't like children. So why wouldn't his book be called I Hate Kids? And that immediately became the, the title of the movie. 
So it, we changed it from without a hitch to I hate kids. And we knew the title was working because every time we said it to somebody, they laughed. Every single time. We said, what's the name of the movie? It's called I Hate Kids. And they would laugh <laughs> because everybody can appreciate that one way or another. You know what I mean? And, uh, uh, and then um, we started showing it around, or Todd did. I, I wasn't involved in that part of it. Todd's the, the business end of things, you know. And, um, and he showed it to the, the right people at one point who wanted to, were interested in, in making it. How does that work when, when someone has this idea? Did, did he already write a rough draft of it and then you started working on it? I, if I remember correctly, and I'd, I'd have to check with Todd if this is right, um, I think at the very beginning, I think that there was at least it was either an outline or it was uh, it was a written opening scene, which was a wedding. It was, a, it was an actual wedding um, where this this kid shows up and, and says that you know I'm your I'm your dad. I mean you're my dad, um, and that throws the whole thing into chaos. Um, and but it wasn't it wasn't more than just I think a, a scene. Just so a scene, we really yeah. had to then really develop where it was gonna go. Um, um, we, we picked, we, I mean, Todd already, already imagined it was gonna be a kind of a road trip movie. Oh, okay. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So, I mean, the idea of it being that this guy is about to get married to a woman who, and they both, the, the thing that they share is neither of them are interested in having children. So um, at the, uh, originally it was the wedding itself in the, in the final draft of the script, the shooting script, we had it, um, the wedding rehearsal because that would put a, uh, a ticking bomb uh, into the script automatically. So he's got to figure. He's got to get this problem figured out before the wedding, which is in three days. So, um, uh, so this kid shows up, says, "You know, you're my dad," and uh, he doesn't believe him, of, of course, uh, at first. But um, this, <laughs> he's the kid has brought along with him this psychic, um, the amazing Fabular who has determined that Nick is, in fact, this kid's uh, father. And uh, it, Nick still doesn't believe it, of course, until um, we have this very funny scene that we worked out where how, how does the kid know for sure that that's his dad? And I'm pretty sure I came up with this. Um, because he's a celebrity of some sort, right? His barber has been selling locks of his hair on eBay. So the kid buys a lock of his hair on eBay and then sends it to a DNA lab with his own hair and oh, the test yeah. comes back positive, right? Wow. So, but but the, the psychic is still claiming, you know, that it was all his, his doing, right? So the three of them then go on a road trip to try to find the kid's mom. He doesn't know who his mom is. Uh, and at the time, the kid is now 14, 13 or 14, and at the time that Nick, uh, that the kid was conceived, Nick was dating a lot of women. <laughs> so the idea is now he's got to figure out which of these many women is the mother of this kid. And that, so that's what propels everything forward. Um, and uh, I, I remember that we came up with the, the psychic very late in the game, really, and over the course of you know, however many years it was, 12 years or something like that, but um, because we, uh, we just thought it would be funny to have a psychic with a little tiny dog <laughs> going, going along with it, because it also, it also made a triangle for the three main characters to play off of each other. It wouldn't just be the father and the son. You've also got this irritating you know, kind of flamboyant uh, 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 psychic there to constantly be, you know, insulting Nick and, and, be, and being nice to the kid and the kid being nice to both of them. And it set up this really cool uh, dynamic between the three of them. And so are you writing and then emailing him notes? Are you meeting in person? Like, how, how does this work when... Both. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes uh, we would get together and... Uh, what Todd, Todd used to love when I would uh, basically perform what I had come up with. 
You know, he would, he'd sit back oh. with his glass of wine and I'd put mine down and I would act out. <laughs> I would act out these new ideas. Oh, um, that's interesting. Well, they, you know, this is something also that I, I when I when I teach classes in, in screenwriting or, or whatever, um, uh, I one of the things I always try to, to make aspiring screenwriters understand is it isn't. First of all, it's not just about, you know, watching movies. I hear a lot of people go, well, I watch a lot of movies, so I know that I know how, how movies work. And it's like, well, well no, you don't. <laughs> watching movies is great, and you should do that, but you've got to do way more than that. And it's not just, I think, it's more than just reading uh, books about writing. I think it's much more than that, because you're dealing in a medium that uh, it's, much, it's way more than just um, your words. You, you know, you, you have actors who then have to say those words. So, I always recommend screenwriters take an acting class. Um, I think my background in acting, I mean, I was a theater major at college, so I did a lot of acting, um, a lot of stage work, um, and then I did the horror movies in Canada. Um, that has helped me write dialogue because I can tell as an actor if that's a line that I'm gonna be able to say. Um, I think that it, it, if you can understand how an actor looks at a, a line, it'll help you write a better line for that actor. Can you give me some examples? I like that. Let's say it's the scene where the kid's showing up at the wedding. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you had different ways of him kind of, you know, the whole like, if anyone here objects, I yeah. think you told me that. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. But, but were there other sort of ways you were planning on doing it and you acted it out and realized... Yeah, no, they wouldn't say it like this. They would say it like this. Yeah, I, well, what I do is I try to assign in my head a voice for each character, right? Now, sometimes it'll be the voice of an, uh, an actor that I know, right? I mean, not personally or just, you know, I'm, I've seen movies with that actor. So like when I, so we made Hugh Grant at one point when right. we were making him British, I had Hugh Grant's voice in my head. So it was a lot easier to write that dialogue hearing it coming from his voice sure. in here, you know? Um, and then the acting, um, the acting out part of it is, um, I, I must have looked like a crazy person <laughs> because there were, uh, one, of the, one of the apartments that we lived in back then um, was on the third floor of, in, in like uh, Toluca Lake area uh, of this apartment building. And there was a little tiny office at the top of it a little tiny office, and there was a uh, <laughs> there was an access door to the roof, right? And back then, I would stay. I, I could stay up all night writing. I, I was just I was more of a night owl back then. Not anymore. Not so much anymore. But I would I'd come up with a scene, or I'd be close to getting a scene, and it would be two o'clock in the morning, and I'd go outside out onto the roof, and I'd be walking around up there talking to myself. <laughs> Like acting out the part and yep. and and trying to come up with the dialogue that would be true to the character and not be too expositional, which is something that all of us screenwriters must avoid, uh, and and see if it worked. See if it worked just at least you know out loud or or in my head, and that's what I would finally. Um, commit to. And sometimes the character would change voices um, if it wasn't working. Um, my, for, for the amazing Fabular, um, I was telling you earlier that he was, a, you know, the psychic in my head as I was writing it, it was um, Jonathan Harris, um, who was Dr. Smith on Lost in Space, the old TV series. And he was very flamboyant and so forth, you know, and, and, uh, and that was the voice in my head, but when, um, when we went to make the movie and, and, and Titus Burgess got the role, um, he didn't want to play it like that because that he felt like that was too close to a character that he plays on the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. So he wanted to downplay him a little more, you know? And it, so I remember the first couple of days on set, I was very lucky, by the way, that John Asher allowed me to be on set every day Oh, that's great. Um, and, and consulted with me from time to time. Um, he always had the final word, of course, because he's the director. It's 
not my movie anymore, it's his, <laughs> you know. But um, um, Titus um, did not want to play, Titus didn't want to play him the way I had written it, or at least how the voice in my head had written it. Um, and so that took a couple of days for me to get used to. And in the end, it worked out fine. Um, but those first couple of days, I was just like, oh, shouldn't I said the Ash pulled Asher aside. And it's just like, like, should he be bigger and everything like that? And um, but I, I think it also those first couple of days were were, di were difficult for Titus because literally day one, first day, day one, that morning the Emmy uh, nominations were announced and he was nominated, which means that that whole day he was getting his phone must have been just blowing up from his, all of his agents and his managers and his friends and his family all calling him and you know, saying congratulations and everything like that. So I think he was a little, a little distracted this first, uh, first day or so. But, um, but uh, you know, in the end, it's, it's a, uh, he gave a great performance and I'm you know, very, very happy um, uh, that, uh, that he was involved and he, he played, uh, played the role. How was that to be on set in terms of hearing your words repeated back and knowing uh, that it's not really your baby anymore, but you're still there, you still have a tiny bit of say maybe, and most screenwriters aren't really allowed on set, or maybe are they? Mm, is this, was this a rare thing? Uh, it depends. Um, this is the first, this was the first movie where I, I had complete access. So, uh, I, I was allowed there every single day. Um, uh, the first movie that I had made um, was uh, a movie called uh, Naked Souls, which was a sci-fi movie. And uh, they, they let me, like they didn't stop me from coming to the set, <laughs> but I didn't feel like, I, I, because it was, it was the first one, it was the first movie that, of mine that was getting made, um, I, I, I didn't feel comfortable like showing up there every day. You there know. wasn't a chair with your name on no, it. No, absolutely okay. not. <laughs> absolutely not. I have one of those now, though. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but you were allowed to pop in. I was, and but like other times, though, I mean, um, uh, there were uh, these two children's movies I wrote for Paramount that um, I had to write. I had to write them both in two weeks um, because they the scripts that they had. They were already too far into the production. So they already had costumes made and everything like that, and they were, but they were shooting it in Prague. And these scripts just weren't working. And so they basically hired me to write two scripts, the, the first one and the sequel. They were gonna shoot back to back in two weeks. So the first week, I wrote the first one. <laughs> second week, I wrote the second one, sent them off to Prague, and never saw any footage of it until the movies came out on VHS. So for this one, you were allowed on set yeah. and you felt like you were welcome. I, well, I was, which, yeah. which is probably a very rare thing. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it helped that Todd Trena, um, you know, was one of the producers. Sure. Um, uh, and, that, and I think that, you know, John Asher was so uh, surprised and delighted that I knew his dad that he, he, you know, we, we got along right away. And, you know, there were, there were rules set up, like, uh, you know, if I had a thought, I had to go to him with it. I couldn't go to the actors. You know, that's just chain of command, um, of, of course, right? And I understood that and respected that. Sometimes the actors didn't understand that. Uh, uh, God, I love Rachel Boston so much. She's she's the lead in the movie, and um, and she's become a very dear friend, and I love her to death. But she got, she almost got me in trouble one day because I was outside. They were shooting. We were shooting at this country club um, out in like Arcadia, really fancy place, and it's so the wedding reception reception scenes. And so they were in there, and it was kind of a tight room. So I said, I'll just I'll just watch it on Video Village, you know, or it's out and whatever. And um, I'm outside and, and so one of the PAs comes up and goes, um, uh, you've been requested on set. So I go, oh, okay, right, flying in, right? And just, you know, <laughs> you, when you're requested on set, you get there as fast as you can. And I get there and I go through these, there's these open doors like this, right? I come in like this and, and Asher just looks over at me and goes, what? What do you want? <laughs> and I was like, I was summoned? <laughs> And Rachel was just like, oh, 
I'm sorry, I, was, I wanted to ask Frank a question about my character, and I was just like. Interesting. That's who you ask. <laughs> ask, ask John Asher, right? And I wasn't saying that to, to embarrass her. I was just trying sorry. to, I didn't want John to be mad at me. Um, but it was all good. It was fine, you know. Yeah. Um, but, you know, but that's, you know, you, those are things you have to understand, too, if, um, you know, especially if it's your first movie. Follow, you know, learn the rules quick. Know who everybody is fast because you don't want to be saying the wrong thing to the wrong person. Right. right. Um, and that's just, that's just stuff that you learn from, from being on sets. And luckily, I had been on sets in other capacities over the years <clears throat> that, uh, I, so I knew most of those rules already. Right, and plus, this not only did did um, you you know his dad, but his dad was instrumental in creating this film in some sense because you stayed and and you remained just doing screenwriting, whether you took a break to do animation, whatever. Yeah, you you, you felt because of that that one conversation. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Yeah. This guy's not blowing smoke. I'm yeah. going to stay. Yeah, and and so that was just it's very interesting. Yeah, no, without a doubt, and and. Um, uh, it was so cool. I got to. I also. I, I got to meet on set on on I Hate Kids. I met um, John's sister uh, Rebecca, and Rebecca uh, is uh, Elizabeth Montgomery's daughter, and she's a really. Uh, she's a terrific director. She directs a lot of uh, sitcoms, um, uh, a lot of television work. Um, oh. So she took after her dad also. Hmm. Uh, uh, and so I got to tell her the story too. So it was, yeah. it was really, it was really cool. I, it was, this was, this was a perfect storm basically for right. this film. Yeah. Do, do you ever think about, you know, I may never, not that you, you won't sell a script again or have a movie made, but in terms of it being this very special dynamic that this might've been, it's kind of a one in a million type of thing. For I think many so. People? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think that, um, uh, this was a this was a very very special kind of film. Even even the actors who came on board were all just uh, nobody was no there were no divas there was no you know ego trip anything like that. Um, you know Marissa Tomei came in uh, on our first day and was completely professional um, and it was a joy to listen on my first day. Listening, Marissa Tomei reading my dialogue was pretty oh, cool. cool. Yeah, that would be yeah. really cool. Yeah, that's cool. And I, she's from New York as well. Isn't yeah, she? she's yeah. from Brooklyn. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah but she she could, um, I I'd met her before um, through Todd, um, but she she um, the, when I met her before at a party, she she uh, made fun of me because uh, I, she, I said I'm from Brooklyn. I, I I lived in Brooklyn. She goes, oh yeah, what part? It's not what Brooklyn Heights. And she goes, Pfft. she goes, that's not Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> but um and um tom everett scott was our lead and um uh you know that thing you do like this is like his first movie working for uh tom hanks um and he's also um he's become a friend and he is he was perfect like i hear him delivering those lines and i was like that's that's exactly exactly what I wanted to hear. And so that was really cool too. And Ray Seahorn too. Ray Seahorn from um, Better Call Saul. She's the lead on Better Call Saul. She played the sister of, of Rachel Boston, who's pregnant in the movie. And um, she actually, she, her delivery was even better than, the, than the, the voice that I had in my head, you know. She's got a great sort of droll humor um, and, and delivers it with with an arrow. Because you know? right, she's very doubting of the main characters, and she's sort of almost like the yes. saboteur. Yeah, which, yeah, which which created our uh, basically our kind of subplot was the two sisters, uh, one sister trying to convince the other sister that he's he's up to something, that he's up to no good, because he's he's trying to keep it all a secret. He doesn't want them to know about his illustrious past and what a sort of a, a ladies' man he was back then. Uh, and the fact that he is a kid when he thinks that, you know, that his, his uh, in, if his fiance doesn't want children. So this could put a monkey wrench in everything, you know, which is why he's going to these extremes to try to get this figured out in three days. Um, so the subplot is are the two, the two sisters uh, trying to figure out what's going on. And so they're sneaking into his apartment and, and, you know, like going through his stuff to figure out like 
what is he up to? Um, and it all it all works. Uh, it all it all works as any good screenplay does, where you've got your 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 different plots that are running, you know, perpendicular to each other, and at some point they have to they have to dovetail in. Sure. And uh, I, you know, but it took us years to get that right. <laughs> you know, years. I thought something I probably should say also, because it's something that I think is really important for aspiring screenwriters, which is that your first draft is nothing more than you, I usually say, vomiting up these ideas that are in your head and getting them out of your head and onto paper or onto your, your screen. And trying to make a perfect first draft is a waste of your time because that's not what first drafts are for. First drafts are for, for my, this is my opinion. You know, there are other you know, screenwriters who might disagree, but, but I think it's just about, it's like, get it out, get it out of there, because you can't look at it objectively unless you can look at it. You know what I mean? You can, because, yeah, you, they, they are, it's all running around up in here, but you get it out and look at it, and then you can really tell if something is working or where there might be a gigantic hole or whatever, the, the second draft is way more important than the first draft because the second draft is where you can then start to chip away or add or, you know, like it's almost like if it was a sculpture. Sure. Are you creating an outline before you yes. do this messy first draft? Okay. So yeah. it's like you're making this this bust or whatever, you know, this like, you know, Mozart and you're in your, you're gonna, but it's just this lump of clay or whatever, but you kind of know, okay, well, I know his head's gonna be here and we're gonna do his vest and all, you know, these different things. Right. You're not just like, here, let's try this. You have a plan. I, yeah, I, I always have a plan. Um, I might not, the third, the third part, I, I almost said third act, and that's something that I don't always, agree with. I don't always agree with the first, second, and third act kind of thing, right? It's, uh, I, I, I think that if you, if, uh, like the save the cat mentality, um, which is that, you know, everything's so codified that this has to happen here, and this has to happen here, and this has to happen here. I think that's, st that the danger of that is it could stifle imagination. Um, but when I do an outline, um, I don't necessarily fill in that last part. The ending? Yeah. Because I want it, because so many things can happen along the, that road of getting to that part that I, I like to leave it. I mean, I've sort of, of course I have some idea of how it's going to end, but I don't want to, I don't want to put in too many details because I want to see how, if, if the ending will find itself almost organically. And I trust in that it it will it will find its way as we get closer. So so yes, I do have an idea of what that ending is going to be, um, but I don't want it to be I I don't want it stamped and solid. Why? So yeah, I, I see what you're saying there. So so even though you said Todd had just a rough outline of the of the first scene or or first act or whatever for the most part, yeah. if you were to do. Let's suppose you wrote it from scratch and, and it was just completely your idea. You would have just done this sort of illustrious bachelor, finally finds the one, and then, you know, filling in there's a wedding, there's a kid shows up, but then this road trip movie, maybe you wouldn't, I, and I don't know how yes. it ends. So you would kind of leave that last right. scene or scenes on un. Yeah, and I think that one of the things I did in particular for for that script was, you know, we knew that they were going to have to go and visit all these different women along the road, as they get to know each other and they their develop their their relationship develops. Um, so I didn't right away. I didn't say, okay, they're going to meet this kind of person, they're meet that kind of person, etc. And what was really interesting is two like two or three days before we started shooting, like two or three days before principal photography, right? Um, it might have been maybe a little more than that. It might have been like a week. But John Asher came to me and he said, I need a scene 
for Marissa where it ha I, I want I need her to be a really strong woman character because we have a lot of kind of crazy characters that that they meet because it's a comedy <laughs> you know, right um, and uh, so basically I I had to come up with a whole new scene right before we we made the made the movie and so you know I think we I don't remember if we if we added her, if we pulled one that was one that was, one that was existing, I mean th those those women went through all kinds of changes as we went along. In the original script, uh, Arden Marine, who is just a brilliant comedian, um, her character um, and in the original script was uh, the, the 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 stereotypical crazy cat lady, who they show up at her house and she has just dozens <laughs> of cats everywhere. Right, uh -huh. and of, What's and of wrong course, with that? Fabular has a little <laughs> tiny dog that he's uh -huh. hiding in his, you know, in his shirt, basically. And <laughs> of course, at, at some point, the dog jumps out of his shirt, and all the cats go crazy, and <laughs> and then everything just goes to chaos. It was going to be a very big sort of slapsticky scene. Uh -huh. um, unfortunately, <laughs> number one, um, uh, uh, the budget wouldn't allow for us to have dozens and dozens of cats, which are. You know the expression "herding cats." Well, that's what you'd be doing half the time, right? Even if you see, even if you use CG to put in a whole bunch of them, it would still. I mean, it would still be um, not cost-effective, let's say. Um, and plus the fact that uh, John Asher, myself, and Titus Burgess were all very allergic to cats, <laughs> so oh. you know that was going to be a problem. So John Asher actually came up with a with an alternative idea, which was rather than her have uh, rather than her be a crazy cat lady, that she's just sort of this crazy mannequin lady, and so we <laughs> fill her house. Her house is filled with all these mannequins who are all dressed up in clothes, and she refers to them as if they're real, you know, real people. Oh wow! And uh, and that ended up working. No, I don't know. I don't say if it was would work better because we don't know how the cat scene would have worked out. But, but it worked. It worked to accomplish what that scene needed to accomplish. Um, John came up with a couple of, of good ideas. That um, uh, several, in fact, that you know some of them were due were, were because of the budget. Like I, you know, when I when you write a set piece for a scene, you always want to write it big because it's you know it's it's usually easier to cut it down than to build up. Right, so start big and then go small, you know, right? Um, and uh, so sometimes, sometimes you have to make adjustments just because your budget is not going to be able to handle that set piece. And um, and John John um, is a is a great director, but he's also he's been in the business his whole life because of his dad, and so he understands, um, you know, what is what we're capable of doing with a certain amount of money and what we're not capable of doing. So he, he made adjustments to the script. By the way, there's something else that, you know, the director always gets the final uh, pass on the script. Um, so so I, I might write 12, 13 drafts. In the end, the one that we're going to shoot is the one that he, he does the pass on. And that's because he's the boss. Oh, sure. And did you two meet together, though, in terms of going over logistics or different things and he wanted your input? Or is that something that's not necessarily done? Um, we went, there was a little bit of back and forth, not much, um, where he uh, he sent me, he did a pass on it and he sent it to me and he asked what I thought and I was terrified to read it. <laughs> I was so afraid because I've had movies made where the director tossed my all my dialogue and put in horrible exposition, you know, nightmare dialogue, and I had no control over that, you know. And so uh, I was a little nervous, even though I, I I liked John Escher immediately when I met him, and I, I you know, faith that he was going to do a good job. I still, when he sent me that version, I, was, I started reading it. I was just, I was really, <sighs> okay, here we go, you know, but. As it turns out, the I would say probably seventy-five to eighty percent of the the script was still mine. That he made changes that he needed to make, um, uh, and I and I know that I also know that John Landis uh, and John sat down earlier on and went without me and went through the script page by page, line by line, 
and John Landis being the director of some of the greatest comedies of all time, basically said the ones that he thought worked and what he thought didn't work. So I, it's a team process for sure. Did you get to see the final edit before the premiere or was that okay? So it wasn't like you were walking into this premiere? And no, actually it was like, again, this is, and this is not the norm. This is definitely not the norm, but I, will, I was invited to go to the, uh, the sound mix, the final sound mix. So I got to sit there with, with Todd and with John Landis and with John and, and the producers. And um, they actually um, uh, asked my input of what I thought. And I, I, John Landis laughed because I, at one point, um, I think Todd said, Frank, what do you think? And I said, well, I said, well, I'm the writer. As long as I can hear my dialogue, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Landis, Landis said, I think Landis said, yeah, spoken like a true writer. What a, what a cool experience. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, it sounds like a really, like a, a dream come true, not just just seeing it kind of come to life and the different parts, but also being included. It's and that was, that's really what made it special because like I said, I had, I've had other movies made before, you know, most of the time I, it's a set visit uh, or not at all. I mean, uh, in the second movie that I had made was, shot entirely in uh, South Africa. And you know, they don't bring the writer <laughs> along to do something like that. So, um, so this, was, this was a very unique uh, opportunity um, as a screenwriter. Um, and, uh, and it was nice. It was, it was very nice. And um, I just, I made great friends um, you know, with, with those people. And they were all still in touch. Do you believe in screenwriting courses? Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, um, I'm not sure if I believe in the screenwriting contests. Um, I've heard stories, of, some of them are kind of shady. Um, but um, yeah, no, courses are terrific. Um, I'm assuming, of course, that the instructor is qualified to teach them, um, but that's true of any course of anything, right? Um, I think that uh, you, like I said, I, I think I said earlier that you know, screenwriting is not just about writing screenplays. <laughs> I mean, it is, but it isn't. I mean, you have to learn so much more. There's so much. There's so much to be learned. You can't just watch movies. You can't just read one book about it. Um, you know, when I first started, there were there were two books that I really that, that I really got something. At, three, I should say, three books that I really got something out of. And there's lots of books out there. Um, and they're still, those books are still out there. Um, they're probably a little bit dated. Um, what books were they? Um, uh, Sid Field's book called Screenplay, which is sort of the, the one that everybody reads. Um, William Goldman's um, Adventures in the Screen Trade is not really a, a how-to book, but it does explain his process in, in a lot of ways. And he also talks about you know, being on the set of movies that he's written the screen, uh, screenplay for and so forth. And that's, that gives some insight into what the reality is out there. <clears throat> and um, the one I think I got the most out of was by uh, Linda Seeger, and it was called Making a Good Script Great. And that's where, it, it, what I was talking about before about your, your, your second draft is way more important than your first draft, and your third is probably more important than the second draft and so forth. Uh, until you get to the point where they're just polishes, you know, or just touch-ups or whatever. Um, because that's where you're really going to be able to chisel the script to where it's really supposed to be. Um, so that, that book really definitely impacted me the most, I think. Since you, you draw and you write, how are the two processes similar and how are they different? <laughs> um, well, they're, they're different. Um, Although one of the things that does have like, yes, I get writer's block just like anybody else does. I can also get drawing block. Um, there are some days when it's, I'm just not feeling it. I can remember when working at Disney, <laughs> especially when we were in what they call crunch time, which was the last two months um, when we had to get the movie finished, or at least our, our part of it, um, the, the animation part done. And, you know, we're all we're working, you know, seven days a week, 16 hour days sometimes. And, uh, and you're just, you're bleary eyed and, and your hand is cramping up like a lobster, you know? And um, every once in a while you'd, you'd hear, 
just somebody, like we're all in cubicles, you know, and you'd hear somebody way on the other side just go like, I can't draw. <laughs> oh. We'd all know what that, you're just having one of those days where no matter what you do, you're just, it's not working, you know, and, and usually that's just because you need a break, you know. Um, and the same thing, the same thing with writing, same thing with writing, you know, there are days there, are, I write pretty fast, which is one of the things that Todd has always liked about, um, you know, recommending me or, or working, you know, or hiring me to work on something is that I tend to work quickly. Um, and it's because I will, if I get an assignment, the way the, the most of the time, not always, but majority of the time, for the two months, the first two months, I will, I won't write a word. But that, that, those ideas will be marinating up in here, you know, and I'll, I'll have an, I might get an idea where I go, well, I'm going to write this down because I like this. I don't want to forget it. Sometimes, um, you know, in the, I'll be in the shower thinking of something completely different and boom, oh my God, wow, that's it. That's what I needed for that scene, et cetera, right? And so forth. And then in that third month, I will sit down and I will, I'll blast through it and write it in, sometimes in two weeks. Um, I have been known especially toward the end of the script, I have been known to write 20 pages in a day. And I remember I said to John Asher and he went, what? He's like, no way. He's like, I, I'm lucky if I write three in a day. I said, well, but are there are days when I write three. I mean, you have, to, you have to be in the right mindset and you have to, you know, I mean, it takes, it's a discipline, certainly. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's it's just your your head's not going to be there for it, and that applies to writing or or drawing doesn't matter. Oh wait, you know what? I just want to say one more thing. Oh sure, about please that. do. Go ahead. Um, what's really funny is that I find is that when I'm writing, I always feel like I want to be drawing, and when I'm drawing, I always feel like I want to be writing, <laughs> which is I don't know why that is, but. Uh, it's it's really funny. It's like I'll be I'll be uh, like if I if I'm doing a lot of drawings because I have an event coming up that I need to have drawings for, you know I'll be like I'm like oh god I just I just want to write a sketch I just want to write a comedy sketch or something like that you know and I have to wait till that's done and get to it but um, but it's it it never fails it's always that way it's always that way. You think we romanticize doing something else when we're in. When we see like the, the reality of what something is, that it is very difficult, it's not just the image of it. Oh, sure. Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, um, I certainly had a, a different um, vision of what uh, animation was before I actually learned how to do it. And then, and then found out. Oh, this is this is hard. <laughs> this is harder than I thought. And that's actually true about screenwriting too. I mean, you know, I first I thought screenwriting would be a breeze. And and the the reason I even started writing was because um, we were making one of those Canadian horror movies, and um, it was Rock and Roll Nightmare, and. We we made that movie in like seven days for you know for for no money at all. We were all you know working different jobs and so forth. And and John Fasano, who was the writer director, was overwhelmed because he was constantly having to answer questions, a hundred questions an hour. And um, there was a scene he needed a bridge. Um, and this actually funny. This happened on I Hate Kids twice. Um, he, he realized that there was a hole in the script, that he needed a, a bridge between this scene and this scene, right? Because they, could, they wouldn't work if they were next to each other. So he needed just a little scene that's gonna go plop right in there, right? And so um, in that movie, I was playing one of the band members and, and my, my, my wife, Leanne, who was not my wife at the time, was playing my, we were playing newlyweds, right? And so the scene was supposed to be late at night where all these other things are happening in the house, but we're, we're on our honeymoon and we're supposed to, so it's supposed to be sort of a, uh, you know, a post lovemaking scene where we're just lying there and we're talking. And John said, just, just write some dialogue between you and Leanne. So I sat down and I wrote this little half page, or one page 
bit of dialogue. And um, John looked at it and he goes, oh, this is great, cool, let's, let's shoot it, right? And we shot it and I, and I realized that as I was writing that scene, I was, I was getting bit by the, by the writing bug because I realized how much I, I really enjoyed it. But again, I had not done my homework at that point. Like I was, I was just, just utilizing my imagination as best I could. And also knowing I was writing it for me and I was writing it for someone I already knew. So, uh, but I liked it and um, uh, to this day, I mean, no offense, John, but um, I, it's the best written scene in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I mean, it, but that started the ball rolling for me to say, okay, I like that. I, that was fun. I want to do more of that. Because, I mean, as much fun as I was having as an actor, you know, you play a role as an actor, and that's really cool, and that's really fun. When you're a writer, in a way, you're playing all the roles. You know, which is what, I, like I said before, about my, my acting background has definitely helped me write dialogue for my, for my screenplays. Um, but it's funny, also, that, that kind of thing happens a lot, by the way. If you're, if you're on set, or even sometimes if you're not on set, you might get a call from the director saying, I need, um, I've got a hole here, I need it filled, I need a small scene. The great part about being on set was that, um, you know, John would come to me on set and say, you know, uh, I need a scene that we can shoot tomorrow with, um, with Ray and, and um, Rachel uh, between, the, between the two sisters and it's gonna be in a car, but it needs to bridge this scene and this scene, right? So he goes, can you, can you give me something? So I, I, you know, I had my laptop on set, so I sat down and I, and I came up with this quick little scene. It was only about six lines. The, the best part about it was though, I was like, Rachel, Ray, come here. I was like, look, I just wrote this. I wanna hear how it sounds because this is gonna be, this is your scene for tomorrow. And so they were able to, to read it right there in front of me and I could hear if it was working or not. You know, so that was, that's again, that's a very rare circumstance. Sure. And we did another one uh, later with, um, with Tom Everett Scott and um, um, uh, the actor who was playing, Julian, who was playing his, um, his son. They were just walking down the street and just a little bit of conversation, a little bit more ca of character interaction for them. And, like four, four or five lines, something like that. But written on set and basically shot the next day. So unusual, but um, uh, and un only unusual because I, because I was doing it on set. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it happens where the, the, uh, the director will call a writer who's not on set and say, I need a scene by tomorrow. I'm sure that happens all the time. But this, this was unique in that regard. What makes a great story? Boy, that's a, that's a good question. What makes a great story is if it's something that I can't walk away from. Uh, that I, I if, if, if you've got me, cause, because I mean, there's all kinds of stories. I can, I can be specific about this kind of story, you know. Um, but I know that if, if I'm able to walk, a, walk away from, from a movie, even, even just to go, you know, use the restroom or whatever, you know, go make a sandwich and not pause it. It means, and that's the world we live in now, right? It means, it means that that story has, has got me. Um, and I also, I, I love dialogue. I, I just, if, if, and that's the thing I pride myself the most on. Um, and I, I, if, if dialogue crackles, like a fire, I, I love it so much. I like, I watch a movie like Lawrence Kasdan's um, Body Heat and the dialogue in that movie is just, oh my God, I just, I would love to write something that good because it snaps, you know? Right. It's, it's beautiful, it's beautiful. Um, I, there's a really interesting, there was a movie came out, um, I don't know, three or four years ago now, I think, um, it was, um, a, a great movie with Kurt Russell, and it was called Bone Tomahawk. 
And it was very interesting because it, it was actually a horror movie, but it was very cleverly disguised as a character-driven Western, right? And the thing that kept me watching it was the writer wrote these, this incredibly great dialogue between all of the characters had great dialogue. And that, to me, more than the story itself, was propelling everything forward. Because I couldn't wait to hear what they were going to say to each other next. Um, so those are the things that definitely, you know, get my, get my blood pumping. Right, like Glenn, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Yes, the, the dialogue Man, for that is just unbelievable. <laughs> right, and just, just yeah. e even if this isn't your type of film, but, but it keeps you hooked in each of the characters and then their agendas, whether they're overt or covert, you know, and just the, just the dynamics, I mean. Yeah, yeah, Kaz, uh, Lawrence Kasdan, um, you know, Mamet, obviously. Um, you know, some of my friends have been in movies, David Mamet movies, and it was just like, wow, that's pretty cool you got to do got to read mammoth dialogue you know um, um, but uh, that's that's for me that's the, the biggest part of it I mean obviously if a, if a, a, a plot um, is it's so full of holes that you can't you know, you're, you're, you're almost laughing at it well that's a big problem but but I'm 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 more turned on by by great dialogue than than more than anything else. Well, even in in something that's supposed to be campy or or you know, I mean, you oh, yeah. you were in the um, the Black Roses mm -hmm. and just watching the the few snippets. I mean, there was some great dialogue in that. Whether it was like over the top, I mean, the things that were coming out of these characters' mouths were it was really funny. Yeah. It was like laugh out loud funny. So even though it may be like so over the top that somebody really wouldn't say that, it worked. Yeah. And, and so well, that's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, something else, too. It's funny because, because uh, especially in, uh, like, horror movies, um, if, you, if you go back to the, like, 1960s and you look at uh, the, the British um, Hammer horror movies, the, the movies that would star Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee, um, Peter Cushing was absolutely brilliant because he could take dialogue that on paper must have sounded ridiculous like talk, just talking about, you know, him play, He's playing Doctor Frankenstein, and he's talking about, you know, re rejuvenating the soul of, in a dead body or something like that. Or, or he's playing Doctor Van Helsing, talking about, you know, how sneaky vampires are or whatever. You know what I mean? And Peter Cushing was the kind of actor who could take that dialogue and say it with such conviction that you totally went with it. You didn't even blink. You were just like, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, and th that's, you know, that's when you're really lucky. When you, when, as a screenwriter, if you get an actor who can do that, you're, you're home free, you know? Absolutely. I was lucky. I had Marissa Tomei, and I had, you know, uh, uh, Tom Everett Scott and Ray Seahorn, you know, people that could do that, you know? Do you use index cards when you're writing a screenplay? No, I don't. Um, I know a lot of people do. I've tried working that way. Um, and for me, it, it, it's just not, I don't know if it's a, you know, the way your left side brain or whatever. But I actually, what I always use, um, and they're actually getting harder to find, those big legal yellow pads. And I just start, I just start writing. And I start writing, you know, sometimes... Um, I'll get hit with a, like a little, just a little snippet of dialogue that pops into my head and I'll write it off to the side, but I'll basically go, I'll keep working like this, working my way down. And as I, re as I go through it and review it, I might see, say, oh, well, you know what? Maybe I don't need that. Or maybe, maybe I should put this earlier. And I'll try to get as much of that as I can. Again, still leaving that, that last little bit open-ended, right? Um, and then I will sit down at a... So I'll do that with a pencil, by the way. Like a oh. hand. Yeah, right. So then I'll sit down at the computer and I'll start writing an official outline that will, that will actually go scene by scene. I'll always put in little bits of dialogue that help, that just help with the tone, especially in a comedy. Um, because I mostly write comedies. I most, I should say, I'm mostly hired to write comedies. Um, uh, 
I like to I like to put in a little bit of dialogue because sometimes that helps just establish for someone else who's going to read it, not for me, but for someone else who's going to read that outline. Um, it, it'll help establish a character's tone, you know, um, and and also what the what the the overall tone of the comedy is. Is the comedy slapsticky like Faulty Towers, or is it more you know more restrained? Um, you know, so, um, you know, more like, um, um, oh, I don't know, uh, like election, like a movie like election, you know, um, you can help, you can help establish that by having some of the characters say a little bits of lines or maybe a funny gag or something like that or something that just, just, I, I like the kind of, uh, dialogue that you'd see, um, in, uh, uh, like shows like The Office and like Park, Parks and Recreation, you know that that kind of banter I like a lot, and I try to you know try to um, not not copy that, but try to utilize that same sort of um, that same sort of tone and that same sort of uh, snap. Sure. Yeah, I was watching Masterclass, and Jodie Foster gives a great Masterclass, and so she was talking about Little Man Tate mm -hmm. and how they they started, you know, fleshing out these characters, and and it was just really fascinating to hear about, you know, and, and you could you could see if if you would, if you tried the test of you know covering up the name of the of the character and seeing you know. Yes. Diane Weiss's character, I hope I'm saying her name right, mm -hmm. versus Jodie Foster, and then Little Boy, you could tell just kind of by the the way something was said. You know, Jodie Foster was supposed to be more working class. Diane was supposed to be sort of this, you know, affluent snob that was, you know, so you could just kind of see the difference in who the characters were. Yeah. Do, do you find that, that that is a test for you to kind of... Yeah, you know what? Um, that's one thing that Todd was, was always good at when we, were, when we were writing together was that, I, I mean, I, I, would sh I would give him a, a pass, show him the latest pass on it. And, you know, he would, he would always say, like, does this line belong to this character, or or is it someone else that has to say that should say that line? Um, but this one of the one of the couple of scripts that I'm being um, uh, hired to write right now, um, the, um, which I, I should, probably shouldn't even say the name of it, but there are three lead women characters, and they're all um, they're two of them are elderly, and one of them is is much younger, and. Originally, it was three elderly women, and on the third draft, we decided to make some changes, and we made the one of them much younger, right? Just, to, just so they weren't all the, the same, because we were getting into a situation where it was like, who, who, who's saying that line, right? So that was one way that we solved that that issue by by having the one character drop her down, you know, from from being a a 60-year-old woman to being a 30-year-old a, a woman, well, that automatically, just that change alone is going to change the dialogue, uh, her dialogue, and it's also going to change the way the other two characters respond to her. Right. Yeah, and, and I, there is a generational tone to how something is said. Yeah. And I think there's also an East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, Southwest, North. I think there's different, like I notice people from, the East Coast say, and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. I don't hear that as much from California mm. natives. And they, they might be like, yeah, and, you know, so it just kind of continues or whatever. You know, it's more, it's looser. Yeah. You know, but there is, you can, there's different, uh, just like there's regional accents, I think there's regional right. ways of saying something, explaining something. Yeah, and that's, oh, that's another thing too, is um, I, I once um, was hired to write, um, uh, it was a, it was a Christmas movie but it was set in um in new orleans and oh. um so you know there, there's Great some dialogue. interesting accents yeah. down there right and the characters some of the characters obviously they live there they're going to have some of those uh, going to have that accent sure and one of the lead characters was actually a cowboy from texas an old an older gentleman so i was now working with the, those voices in my head as i'm speaking we're working with all these different kinds of uh of accents now and you know that so that that in that way, believe me, it was very easy to know who, which character was saying what. You know? <laughs> but um, but yeah, um, um, it, you you have to. It, it's it's it, the script is going to work for someone else, not just yourself. For someone else to read it, it has to be very clear what what character is saying what. 
Sure, sure. Yeah, and I feel like see, it's like another term, a stone's throw away. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever used that term. <laughs> but I've known people that, that they use that in like every five minutes or something, you know. Yeah. So it's just there's just certain like catchphrases and different things. Sure. Um, idioms or whatatever, I don't know, but yeah. that people from yeah, different you, areas yeah, seem right. to Right, and use. you can use those you can use those to assign to a character that will help establish who that character is. Um, I mean, certainly they, they I mean, see it in, in, in television series all the time because they have to constantly do that because it isn't just a two hour movie. You know, you're talking about episodes and episodes, episodes and so on, and so on you know. Um, I, my favorite TV series of all time is Faulty Towers, the uh, John Cleese uh, sitcom, which only had 12 episodes. But it's, to me, it's the funniest show that's ever been made. And if, if you look at the scripts, um, which, which they stuck to, they like they didn't change a word of those scripts. Um, you can you can you can know who's saying what line very easily because those characters are so well defined, and um, that's part of what make what makes it so great. Who are the protagonists that you love? What do you love to write in terms of Eve, whether it's comedy? But what type of protagonist? I I, I definitely like. A protagonist who is able to maintain a sense of humor no matter what is going on. Um, I'm I'm a big fan of sarcasm. Yes, <laughs> um, I know you, well. <laughs> yeah, um, I, if you if you see I Hate Kids, you will you will see that it's it's dripping with sarcasm. <laughs> um, and and that's just because I think I think that comes from the the influences that I had growing up. At least for comedy, um, my my biggest influences were um, the Marx Brothers, um, Bugs Bunny, and Faulty Towers. And if you look at any one of those three things, you will see that even the Bugs Bunny cartoons, there's a lot of sarcasm going on there. And um, so for me, that's that's the the really fun stuff to write um, when a character can just snap back a, a, a sarcastic line at somebody. I just I. I, I love the process of coming up with what that retort is going to be. Um, that's, that's fun. That's the fun part of it all. Well, I mean, that's why Taxi and Cheers, too, yeah, absolutely. so funny because mm -hmm. each one had their own sarcastic take on the world, you yeah. know, whether it was Louis or whatever, you know, just there was just and, and waiting for that friction to occur, whereas yeah. things that were a little more, I don't know, if it, is it deadpan? Yeah. It, okay, then maybe less so when... Um, and I think sarcasm is an, is an acceptable way of communicating more on the East Coast. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, probably. Okay. I mean, that would make sense since yeah. I was raised there. So. Sure, sure. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm used to that East Coast influence as well. And I feel mm -hmm. like people sometimes don't get it when you're being sarcastic. Maybe I'm just not being funny or something. But I think <laughs> sometimes sarcasm could be yeah. when you're actually trying to be friendly and it, it doesn't it can backfire yeah so in person it can backfire but in a script it mm. creates great a great tension yeah yeah um and it, it it's it especially provides the it's an open gate for for humor and and that's that's really what i love the most is 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 writing that line that i know is going to make todd laugh <laughs> okay, that's that's your litmus test. Yeah, is well, this Todd I, train a lot? I, I, I love it. <laughs> Todd will tell me that he was, you know, because he, Todd travels a lot. He's a very busy person with a lot of things going on, and so sometimes he'll, he'll the only time he'll have to read uh, up the the latest draft of a script or whatever is when he's on an airplane flying, you know, from the East Coast or whatever. And he'll tell me that, you know, he he'll call me the next day and say, you know, that he could say, you had me cracking up on this airplane, you know, and then I'm like, okay. Got it. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> right. That's the true test. Are you in a public spot and you yeah. can't contain your laughter? Exactly. And, yeah. uh, and is everybody staring at you? Yeah. So. <laughs> how good of an artist do you have to be to work for Disney? And how did you get that good? Okay. So you have to be a very, very good artist to work for Disney. And <clears throat> that means that you need to have again, done your homework. You need to have taken classes. You know, you need to, to they, what they want to see from you 
is that you can draw, that you can not, not, just, not just draw cartoons, Any, you know, anybody can do that, right? That you can draw the human figure correctly, that you can push, push that figure, like plus it. Like, so if, if, a, if, 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 something's, if somebody's leaning over, that you can make it, enhance it so they're leaning over. Because that's part of what animation is all about, right? When I was there, um, even though we already had the, jo had the job, right? Everything's going great. Every day at lunchtime, maybe it wasn't every day, but at least a few times a week at lunchtime, they had a drawing lab downstairs. And, and at lunchtime, instead of going to the cafeteria and eating your lunch or eating your lunch at your, in your cubicle, you could go down to the drawing lab, take your lunch if you want, and they would have a model there. Sometimes a nude model, sometimes um, a, a model in an elaborate costume, right? And they, they had um, an instructor there who was one of the original story guys from, you know, um, who worked on, you know, movies like Peter Pan and Dumbo and whatever, who would, who would walk around and see what you're doing. And um, Walt Stanchfield was the instructor who was there when I was there. He's passed on now, but he, well, he terrified us <laughs> because he would walk around behind us as we're, we'd have a model and we're, we're working and, and, you know, and you'd have a time limit. You know, you'd have, you'd have they, they might do, okay, these are 10 second sketches. Go, 10 seconds, boop, stop. 30 second sketches, one minute sketches, and sometimes it'd be 20 minutes. Um, but you're working, and, and you're working with a charcoal pencil that you're, you know, you're working very quickly and lightly and so forth, gesture drawings. He would walk around behind us, circle around behind us, and he had this big black magic marker, right? And if he, if he came up behind you and he saw that you weren't push, doing enough of enhancing it and pushing it, he, he'd go, no, 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 no. He'd come in with that big black magic marker and on top of your drawing, he would just go, look, Go like this, like this, push, you see, and this and that, squash, squash, you know. And, and, you, <laughs> and so the more black marker you had on your sketch pad means the more you were not doing what you were supposed to be doing, right? And, and you know, this was, we were volunteering ourselves to do this, and they encouraged it, of course, because you want to, especially when you are, when you're, when you're doing, I was a cleanup animator, so I'm doing the, the nice, really clean, finished line that you see on the on the screen, right? Working from an, um, on the original animator's rough drawings. So, but when you're drawing like that, you can get really tight, you know, because you're very. They have to be perfect lines, right? So at lunchtime, going down there and then with a with a model and being really light and loose, could really loosen you up and and you know make you relax and. Bring, bring, your, bring your shoulders from this down to this. <laughs> um, and they're all exercises, really, but it's also to keep you, keep you sharp. Um, um, keep, you, keep, keep, keep in mind that this is why you're here, not, not because you can draw Mickey Mouse. That's the reason that, you're, that you got there. So, yeah. I think in, in a documentary about Charles Schultz, mm -hmm. I think he talked about, like, when he was at his drawing board, if I'm rem remembering correctly, he felt like he was master of his universe. It was just a really powerful, wonderful feeling for him to just be there creating, and it was just a place of where he wanted to keep going back to. Yeah, some, Is that I, similar? Yeah, I mean, de definitely, um, there's, a, there's a sort of a zen aspect to it um, when, you're, when, you're, when you're in that zone. Um, uh, you know, I, all of us at Disney in our cubicles had, you know, we had CD players and, and you know, some of us had little television sets and, and that were on, but they were really more, it was background noise. Uh, audio books, we listened to a lot of audio books <laughs> there a long time, late at night. Um, and, um, but yeah, but you need to, be, but your focus is here. Um, even if you have a TV on that's, that's you know, watching, some great movie, you know, King Kong is on, you know, and you still, but you still have to stay focused on this. You can hear it, but your eyes are here because your eyes are telling 
you know, eyes are going to the brain, the brain is telling the hand what to do. So um, that part of it, and you get, you get used to it. You get very used to it. Like uh, my wife still can't understand how when I'm every once in a while, like when I'm working on, on, a, an, anima on animation these days, that I can be binge watching Narcos <laughs> at the same time, which is most of the dialogue in, in, in Narcos is subtitled. So she was like, how can you do that? When you're and I'm like, I don't know. I'm, I just do it. <laughs> you know? The drawings get done. So, <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a extreme discipline. And you know, the more you do it, you get more, you, the more you get used to it. I think you're the first person that we've talked to who's done animation for Disney. We have people all over the world who watch our channel who dream of doing the same. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can share what goes into making a Disney movie, like how much effort, how much of the stuff behind the scenes do we not see? All the little detail and clearances, things like that. Oh boy, I mean, you know, I was a tiny little speck in a huge process. Um, the animated movies, I'm not sure how long they take now, but it's probably pretty close to the same. The, from beginning to end, from, from you know, the start, you know, script to you know, final, final um, sound mix or music mix or whatever, I, it's, I think, it, as I recall, it was about five years for one move, for one you know, feature animated movie. Um, I think that's still pretty accurate. It can sometimes be longer if um, the movie is troubled and sometimes the movie won't get, will be basically they'll, they'll kill it if it's taking too long. They might, have, they might have three years invested in it and if it's just not working. I mean, when John Lasseter was, was still at Disney, he, he, I know that he killed a couple of projects, or at least one that I know of, that they had been working on and working on and working on. And they kept trying to fix it, trying to fix it. And in the end, it just it obviously wasn't gonna work. So it's like, okay, we, we, we cut our losses now rather than continue. Um, it, I don't think it happens often, but it does happen. Um, but you gotta realize, I mean, like, you know, you're starting with the script and there's usually research even before that. So once it's decided that um, that, you know, this is a project that we're going to do. So for, uh, for, for Tarzan, well, the first thing that has to happen is everybody's got to read the books and then they got to, and they got to look at, this is all the reference materials. They got to look at all the Johnny Weissmiller movies and the, you know, Gordon Scott movies and, and the TV series and comic books and, and all that and, and take it all in and, and see what, what can, you know, what, what elements of that character and those um, uh, that that mythos are going to work within this version, which is not going to be like all the other versions. I mean, obviously there's going to be some similarities because it's all based on the same um, source material. But you know, what is what is what is what is Disney going to bring to to that property that makes it special? So there's all that. And then once, you know, they, they, then the production designers, you know, um, I know for Tarzan, they took a whole group of people, the producers, the directors, the production designers, so, uh, some of the artists, um, a lot more, I'm sure. And they all went to Africa and they all went and saw real gorillas, um, you know, uh, in the jungle. Uh, and spend a lot of time, you know, sometimes the artists sketching them and, and just observing, observing them and seeing what their behavior is like. And, uh, you know, that's all part of the process too. And then, then there's um, visual development. Where they have, you know, uh, the, uh, all these different kinds of artists come in and do different, different scenes just in, uh, in their style. And those, and those paintings, which are almost always beautiful, would be, would be put up in the halls of the, that area, that quad where they're making that particular movie. So you're constantly surrounded by the, uh, the, the imagery and, um, and it helps spark the imagination and helps you, you know, really get an understanding of what, uh, what kind of movie you're making. Uh, I, there's all of that, then, then you know, when you've finally got the script exactly where you want it, then, you've got it, then comes casting, then you're gonna bring in your actors. And the actors have to have to record all of their dialogue, 
before they can start the animation because you need the actors, um, uh, need the actors' voices to to be able to animate to. So I mean, it's just this process go, is a long process with with many 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 different elements, um, and you know, uh, and you know, at Disney, of course, they have uh, you know they can have two or three movies all going at the same time that might be in different stages. So um, uh, it was always interesting. <laughs> there was always something new to see in the hallways, it seemed. Did you see Steve Jobs? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> he would have been third floor. We don't oh, okay, all right. <laughs> so I understood he, he was traveling back and forth for a little bit, but um, from, his, from his book. Yeah, anybody, you know, anybody of that stature would, um, you might see them coming in in the, oh, I see. In, in the morning in, okay. the, uh, in the hallway, but uh, yeah, you didn't approach, so. What, um, what would be some of the reasons that a project, you don't have to give specifics, but that it would be squashed, if, even if you were three years in? If, um, uh, if, if what, what they would do is, um, as, they, as they move along in the process, especially once that they have animation to show, um, they do a, a story reel, which basically would be the entire movie, and either it would be done at, like an animatic where it would be the storyboards, Right, and sometimes it wouldn't be the 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 real the final actors. It would just be people doing scratch, um, uh, voice what they call scratch voices, which is temporary voices. Um, I, in fact, my wife Leanne does scratch for them a lot on uh, on the feature movies, um, but um, but it would be the entire movie, uh, and you would get it so you could get a sense of is this story working? Is it is is the pace working? Is it um, uh, are the jokes working, uh, et cetera. Um, and so they would have these things every, every couple of weeks or maybe once a month or something like that where everybody sits down in the auditorium and we, we watch all the people that are qualified to watch it at that point to, to see how it's working and everybody will give notes. And boy, sometimes no matter what you do, it's just... It, it's not hitting hitting those marks that it needs to hit to work. Um, uh, Home on the Range was the last movie I talked about before, and and that was a movie that had a lot of problems. We were um, uh, it was changing the whole movie was changing constantly. I mean, the basic premise was still there. It was about three cows who were trying to save their their owner's farm. But the the villain changed. The, the 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 motivations changed. Every time we went to see it, it was like like almost a whole new movie. Um, and I, I mean, I, I worked on the villain character in that. And every every time we kept we would start working on him as looking well. I mean, he pretty much looked the same, but the motivations would change for the character every time we went to another uh, another screening. Like what? I'm just curious. I, like, I, just like why he wanted to, to get that farm, like why he needed to get the farm. Um, and, it, you know, they would, they would come up with different reasons. And, of course, when you change the motivation, it, it affects, it's a domino effect to the rest of the movie. You know, any, any time you change anything, it's, it's, um, it's, it's going to impact everything else so um, so that was that was a tough one that was a real tough one and it did they didn't kill it they went they went all the way through when the movie did come out but I it's not my favorite by any means it still for me doesn't really work so and it was also the last it was there was the last one that uh, they did except for princess and the frog several years later it was the it was the last of that era yeah Right. How did it feel the last day that you left? I mean, I'm just, I, did you really have like your stuff in a box or I mean? Uh, well, <laughs> I we, mean we, believe me, we filled those cubicles with stuff. So it wasn't, it, it wasn't just a box. Okay, <laughs> with the plants, right. It was a lot of stuff. Okay. Um, because, you know, especially when you've been there for, for eight years, seven and a half, eight years, you know, you accumulate things. Um, so, we, you know, because there was enough warning, it was like little by little and take it out. So, but I think on the, on the last, my last day, I don't even think I had any work to do and probably it was mostly cleaned out. So it was basically just probably saying goodbye, um, mm. which was, you know, 
it was bittersweet, really, because at sure. that point, at that point, I think, luckily, it wasn't a surprise. We knew it was coming for a long time. And I think I was ready. I think I was like, okay, I'm ready. I'm, it was, you know, go through the stages of, of death thing. Right, the Elizabeth <laughs> so this was yeah, finally, right. This was finally acceptance. <laughs> sure, right. sure, right. So. You've been through the anger and the depression. <laughs> right. That, already, that yes, was a long actually, time ago. It's very similar now that you think about it. <laughs> but I'm sure for some people, though, maybe they didn't want to go. I, it's great to, oh, when no. you're at a job and you don't want to be there anymore and you're leaving, you're like, this is great. I, yeah. I could feel the energy pushing me out the door. But when you don't want to go, that's when it's... Yeah, I, and I, you know, I don't think any of us really wanted to go. But when, when it, 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 there, was, there was no other way, you know, then you had to accept it. So, sure. You know, because, I mean, like you said, for most of the time I was there... Uh, that was a great place to work. It was. You hear yeah. stories about people complaining about Disney, you know, doing this and doing that and everything like that. Well, that was not my experience. I got to tell you, I loved it. I loved yeah. it. I mean, like any job, there were some days when, especially in crunch time, like, sure, sure. Oh God, I just, you know, only got four hours sleep. I don't want to go back in, you know. Right. Or uh, Mary in the cubicle, a couple that was on a loud. Call to her family or something. What other? <laughs> <laughs> My family is always, always there. Oh, okay. Le All right. Leanne's office is right down the hall. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but for the most, yeah, so, I mean, I've heard people that, that absolutely loved working there and, and oh, are yeah. still there. And yeah, especially when I first got there, especially because I, I came in in what um, I call the post Lion King boom. Because you know these things are cyclical. Like there's, there's, they have a big hit movie and it does great, and they've got a couple of successes, and then not so much. There's an era where it's the movies aren't that good, and so forth. And uh, Hercules, we were still riding that high from from Lion King, and um, so and um, also Jeffrey had started DreamWorks down the street, and he was looking uh, to to poach us. Um, so. Uh, the 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 studio was doing everything they could to keep us there. So you know, throwing money at us, <laughs> throwing <laughs> bar parties and, and, and gifts <laughs> and all kinds of things. You know, I mean, it was a it was a fun place to work for for quite a while. Um, but you know, everything changes, things change, um, uh, evolution, and uh, so I'm just happy that I had the opportunity to to work there and you know those movies that I worked on are going to be around long after I'm gone there's still going to be people watching them sure. so you know that's nice to know and last question about Disney and that is just the evolution of the screenwriting mm -hmm. in terms of the emotion that they started putting in and maybe some of the topics that they touched on how did you see that evolve from your time there well I what I saw um, you know the my first movie was Hercules which was very funny and slapsticky and and big and wild and and um and but I saw what they were they were they were definitely experimenting with what else they could do uh with with the medium um and and not just you know not just make movies with princesses and and uh, heroes and princesses and so forth um and and I think um Maybe it wasn't a great idea. <laughs> I love I love Atlantis. I think um, I didn't I didn't love it by the time we were wor uh, finished working on it because it was a very very challenging movie to work on. Um, but uh, since then, um, it came out on Blu-ray. I, I watched it again and I was I, I really actually liked it a lot. But I can understand how at the time, I don't think audiences were 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 maybe ready for that. Uh, ready for that kind of change in a Disney movie? Um, I think that they really just um, they they like their Little Mermaids and their Beauty and the Beasts and you know and uh, uh, even even I mean even Tarzan I mean Jane isn't a princess but she's still that kind of spunky character that um, that I think um, resonates with audiences. Yeah. So I saw this quote on someone's blog the other day and the title was, are stories made or found? It's a fine line between made or found, like what does that really mean, but right. um, is it something that you see someone walking down the street and you just envision what their life is like and you're like, I'm going to write this, or you read an article, hear something on NPR and you say, I want to do a fictionalized version of that. All of the above. Um, 
Uh, sometimes an idea will come to me by seeing um, a, a, a guest on a, on a TV show talking about something. NPR is a great source of that kind of stuff. My, Leanne is always saying to me, oh, I heard this, uh, this great interview on NPR. You should make a script about that, you know? Um, one really interesting one, um, which is nowadays, I just kind of like, oh my God. So the, of the two scripts that I, that I originally came, uh, showed to William Asher, you know, he's, he's the, the, the one he didn't care for because it had a, a supernatural uh, magic element to it, right? Um, that, that was a sort of a modern version of an old Chinese story that was a children's book that I remembered reading when I was a kid. It was called The Five Chinese Brothers. And in it, these, these, uh, this one brother gets in trouble with the emperor and he's sentenced to death, right? But the, each one of these brothers has a power, has an interesting power. So they're gonna, they're gonna so they, and they all look alike, right? So, the, so they're gonna say, okay, we're gonna throw you into the ocean so you drown, right? But the, the one brother has the ability to, to swallow the entire ocean. So he, you know, so he doesn't drown. And another one, they're gonna feed him to an alligator or something like that. And the brother has a, like, a neck that's like unbreakable. And so they keep switching them out and so that they, they can't kill him, right? And um, so in around 1990, oh, maybe earlier than that, 80, maybe 88, 89, somewhere around there, I'm watching, I'm home during the day and I'm watching the Oprah Winfrey show and Donald Trump was the guest. And at that time, they were making him out to be like he was gonna be this, you know, this amazing God-like person that he thinks he is now. And he, but he sounded legitimate. Like he sounded like he was a really, really smart guy and he was really good at things. And I remember that Oprah asked him uh, if he was ever consider running for office, right? And he didn't, he just gave a kind of a vague answer, but I just remember him saying that like, well, I'll tell you this, that if I do decide to, to run for office, I'll do it, I'll do it full on. Like I won't, you know, I won't hold back, right? And I thought to myself, what if this guy knows something that we don't? Like what if this guy can see into the future? Right? And then I started thinking about that Chinese brother story, right? And I thought, what if, what if there was these, these five brothers who were, had built up this huge corporation because no one else knew that each of them had a power? And one of them could, if he held your hand, he could read your mind. And one of them held your hand, he could see a little bit into your future. Another one could hold your hand and he could uh, heal you of your, whatever your illness is. And the other brother, who was a twin, if he held your hand, he could kill you just by touching you. And then there was a fifth brother. And the fifth brother was the one they were grooming to be a politician, right? So that was the basis of this story that, um, uh, that, I, that was the other script that I had with Return of the Gargoyle, right? And it was big. It was, this is like I said, you know, everybody's making a Die Hard movie back then because the, the spec script, um, uh, it was through the roof. It, they, were, they were buying up big, high concept scripts all, all over the place. So, so um, it was a huge movie. The whole thing, like a sky, there's a whole skyscraper on fire at the end and all this kind of <laughs> stuff, right? And, um, uh, but that came from me seeing Donald Trump on the Oprah Winfrey show. Um, and stuff like that happens all the time. I once witnessed in a courtroom, I saw a guy try to get out of a, a, a DUI, um, uh, having to pay the fines or, or you know, do community service or anything like that. And he, and he, and he, said, um, he, he said to the judge, uh, well, I'm a screenwriter. Um, I, could, I could write a PSA about not dr drinking and driving to, um, instead of you know, instead of doing that, and and the judge was like, no, <laughs> but I gave the guy credit for trying, you know, but I came that inspired an idea of a script that I'm working on now, 
right? Just that little little moment that I happen to witness. So you never know where it com comes from. Lately, um, I, I'm now working on the third um, adaption of an existing novel that I've been hired to write. So I, I, I adapted, um, the first one was I adapted a novel that was written by uh, James Franco's mom, who's an, uh, an, uh, oh, she's an author, yeah, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, I was hired to take her novel and make it into a movie because you know you can't, you, you have to make changes in, in adapting. You gotta yeah. sometimes change a lot of things. Um, and uh, the one I'm working on now is a, is a murder mystery that is set in the world of magicians. And that also was an existing material. That was a book that was, so when I was hired, um, or before I was hired actually, my, my manager um, sent me the book and said, read this, tell me if you think you can do something with it. And I read it and I was like, I could definitely do something with this. And so I, and so I was hired to, to do that. Um, so sometimes those things are brought to me. Um, and sometimes also, you know, there's been many times when I think I, I might have said before that um, I'll be brought into a company that has an existing material. I mean, so they call it script doctoring sometimes. Um, and they really want to make this movie. They love the concept, but the script they have is unfilmable. So I'll have to come in and basically usually start from scratch, usually toss the existing material stay with the concept, but make it a movie that, that can be made, in, uh, make, it a, make it a script that can be actually made into a movie, right? That, that works as a movie, as opposed to, um, you know, I, I never even look who the, you know, who the person is that wrote the earlier draft. I had one, oh my God, this one, this was the best. I was brought in for this, to this one project and uh, they said, well, we're gonna send you the script and it's called Beware of Elevators, right? So now, title of the movie is, is Beware of Elevators. What, what kind of movie do you think that would be? Oh, well, maybe some people will be stuck in a high-rise elevator. Right, so like a drama. Sure. And, mm -hmm. You know, maybe a horror movie. Right. Well, that's what I was thinking too, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe well, elevator has a mind of its own. Yeah, yeah. right. So that's, that's what I'm expecting. I get the script and I start to read it. And... I realized about 10 pages in that this is a movie about a guy who dies in an elevator and he comes back as his fiance's dog. And the movie is the guy trapped in the dog's body and we're hearing his thoughts and everything as he's now trying to uh, uh, basically protect his, his fiance and help her get over the grief and everything like that, right? Well, it was... It was just terrible. It was a terrible script, right? And I, first, I was going to pass on it. I was going to say, no, nah, I just doesn't. I'm not going to do a talking dog movie. Sorry. But then, right before then, I just had a thought, and I, and and I thought, what, what can I, what, can, how could I possibly make this work? And what I ended up doing was turning it into a mystery. Because in the original script, you, 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 you find out how the guy dies right away, right? There's a, there, that's, he died in an elevator, right? So what I did was have, the, the guy comes back as a dog, doesn't, doesn't remember why, how he died. And so over the course of the, the script, he start, he little by little, he starts getting flashes of what happened that night. And the further along, the, the more flashes he gets, the more he starts to put it together as to what happened. And so it became more than just a comedy about a, a, a guy trapped in a dog's body. It also became sort of a mystery because we're finding out, it's unfolding, you know, it's like peeling an onion. You're finding out little by little what led to that and how and why did he end up here in this dog's body. And then it worked, and I and I ended up I ended up loving that script. <laughs> it was like one I really loved. It'll probably never get made, but you know that's that's how it goes. I mean, I still got paid. <laughs> so <laughs> that you know that's so funny. That's a that's a big misconception also about screenwriters. 
Okay, people, a lot of people think that um, working screenwriters, what we do, we write a script and then it gets made and then we go in the next script and it gets made and we go in the next script and we get made. I would say 5% of the scripts that I get hired to write get made, 5%, but I'm still a working screenwriter. Uh, you get hired, you write a script, you know, you, um, you get paid a certain amount for that for that script, right? And then that script may never get made. I wrote a script for for um, uh, J Lo, for Jennifer Lopez. That I was like, oh, this got this has to get made. It's for Jennifer Lopez, right? No, nope. did like twelve drafts on it. You know, got paid, but that that movie will never get made. Um, it's when you get a movie made. That's great. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big deal. But yet the rest of the time, you're, you're still working. You're still creating. You're still, you know, if you're lucky, and you're getting hired. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, then there's the matter of coverage. Coverage is a big deal in this, in this business. So coverage is when the, you write a script and the producer sends it to a, um, a script reading uh, company. Right? There are several of them here in, in, in LA. Um, and what they do is they have somebody break, read the script, break it down, and then in the end, there are, there's three possibilities that they assign to it. One is pass, which means no, we're not interested. One is consider, right? which is maybe if it, you, know, you work on it, it might, might have potential, and then the Holy Grail recommend, right? Now, something like 90% of the scripts that these companies get, get pass. Maybe, you know, 8% 8, 8 or so, 9% get consider. And there's variations of consider. There's like consider with, you know, considerations and so forth, right? But it's still in the consider. This is this is pass. This is consider. One percent of the scripts that 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 go through these companies get recommend. So that's what you're up against, you know. And you know, it, if, when you get that, if you if you get that recommend, that's a big deal. That's a huge deal. Yeah. What's the name of the check that you get if if um, it actually? Oh, we call it first day of principal. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because that's that's normally that's when you'd get the money, uh, the rest of the the big money for, for that you would get for for writing the screenplay. Yeah. So uh, a big majority of what you do is writing something, doing many drafts, getting paid that initial chunk. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, something's not going to be. It's not going to go okay. to production, and yeah. you won't get the yeah the remainder of it. But, you know. Keeping working is, uh, you stay focused on it. Um, luckily, you know, sometimes those scripts are great. Just because they don't get made, it doesn't mean they aren't good, and you can use them as, um, as writing samples to show that you're, you're you know, you're not, you're, not, you're not counting on, a, on like, I, I don't show anybody Return of the Gargoyle anymore because it's dated and it's from, you know, from the early 90s or whatever, and um, so, I, I'll, I can show them something that I've written in the last couple of years that uh, is, um, it may, maybe it didn't get made, but it's still, it's still a, a ter I think it's a terrific script, or other, someone else thinks it's a terrific script. Um, and that will um, sometimes, the, um, the person who's looking for a screenwriter might read that and go, oh, I like, I like the attitude you had with this. So um, yeah, we're gonna hire you. You know, and in and, and in the end, best case scenario is of course your movie gets made. But um, but yeah, I mean, working screenwriters are not uh, putting out a movie, uh, you know, every year. We might write three scripts in a year, <laughs> but because uh, um, it's really hard to get a movie made, it's really hard. Anybody will tell you that in this business, it's tough. And with I Hate Kids, there was already financing attached, right? Because Todd had his production company. Uh, well, Todd found an investor. 
Oh, he did. Um, okay. A couple of them, really. But we needed, you need one to, to get you started. You need one, you know, that's going to put in a, a good chunk of that budget so that other investors will go, oh, all right, well, somebody else has put money into it. Um, this, what happens all the time is, you know, a movie starts to go into production and you've got, um, uh, you've got a budget and you're, but you need some other investors. You get somebody, some people interested, but then your first investor drops out and then that's, that's a house of cards that's just gonna, gonna fall. Uh, Todd and I had a movie, uh, boy, it was a while back now, um, uh, another comedy we had written that um, we were in, uh, we were in pre-production. We, uh, we had the office open, we were scouting locations, we were casting, everything like that, everything was going swimmingly. And um, the investors had a clause in their contract that said that they could approve or disapprove the three leads. That killed us because they wanted Reese Witherspoon. And we tried to explain to them, you know, Reese Witherspoon gets, you know, our budget was like three and a half million dollars, right? Our, uh, Reese Witherspoon gets more than that for a comedy, right, alone. That's, that's the whole budget right there, right? I mean, she might do uh, like a, a little art house kind of, you know, Oscar potential role for, for less money. But for a comedy? No. She's gonna, that's our whole budget right there. So they, oh, they want Anna Ferris. Well, Anna Ferris is the same deal, you know. And we, we struggled and struggled and struggled to find somebody they would approve. Um, if I remember correctly, Todd could tell me if, if I'm remembering this right or not, but I, as I recall, read the script and liked it, oh. was ready to say yes, and they, they said no to her. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, wow. so go figure, right? So um, that, really, that, that we ran out of time to make that movie, basically. We had to shut down. Um, it's too bad, because that was a very, very funny wow. script. I, I still love to see that movie get made. Yeah, right? I know. Yeah. I mean, she's done a lot of great work. She's done a lot of great stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I got it so excited. I was like, oh, that would be awesome. That would be and super then, cool. And then a couple yeah. days later, like, I, called the, I called the office, the production office, and the guy was like, now we're shutting down. I was like, oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. So, and I actually, I actually quit a job because, because we were in pre-production, which goes to show you. Nothing, nothing's in stone until it is. Yeah. No. <laughs> Why is there such a backlash toward working screenwriters from screenwriters who have either never sold something or maybe just sold one thing, and there's like this misconception of success? Yeah, I, I think that part of that probably comes from, you know, now we have the IMDB and, and you know, your credits get, get posted there, but the only credits that get posted are the movies that get made, right? So you don't see the, the 10 other movies that, uh, you know, the, the, the writer was hired to do that, you know, may have gone as far along as, as the movie I was talking about a few minutes ago about what that Todd and I did, where we got all the way into pre-production and then, you know, it got shut down. Um, uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes the producers just lose interest in the project. Um, and so there's all kinds of reasons why the movies don't get made. But I, I, I think that um, especially um, writers who are, uh, who are new to the business or trying to break in or something like that, um, they can look at, um, uh, at somebody who's written a screenplay book and say, well, he only made one movie. I mean, I know that the Save the Cat guy, I'm not a big fan of that book, but you know, he had written one big movie, which was um, a Blank Check, I think it was called, or something like that. And, um, and then he, and he wrote this, this book about screenwriting that a lot of people bought. And a lot of people were saying, yeah, well, it was like, so this guy wrote, you know, all these books and he only, he only wrote one movie. Well, no, he didn't write one movie. He wrote lots of movies. It just happens that that particular movie is the one that got made. You know, I mean, I could easily write a book about screenwriting and they would look at my resume and go, oh, you know, you only had, you know, one movie made in the last 10 years, you know, and, and they'd be right according to the IMDb, but they wouldn't see. I, I'm happy to parade out all the checks that I've gotten <laughs> from, other, from other producers and other projects, you know what I mean? Um, and, you know, look, I, I was there once too, absolutely. I'm, I'm, it's before, before you really understand what this business is. 
There's a lot to this business that you don't see, that you don't know until you are in it. Um, because you're basing, you're, uh, you have preconceived notions of what this business is based on what you've seen on television, what you've seen in, in movies about movies. Um, and uh, sometimes, sometimes it's true. A lot of the times it's not. And that, go, and that goes back to, way back to when, you know, making movies about movies from in the 1930s and 40s. You know, that was never accurate. Um, Sunset uh, Boulevard. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> right, oh my God, I mean, um, uh, uh, the Jim, James Cagney movie, Man of a Thousand Faces, which was a biography of, of Lon Chaney, the silent film actor, um, <laughs> is all baloney. <laughs> I mean, there's so much in that movie that is not true about movies. It's not true about Lon Chaney, you know what I mean? But I believed it when I watched that movie. You know, when I saw it when I was younger, I was like, ah, oh, that's, that's how it happens and how it works. You know, that's, like I said before, that's where you know, you're walking on the set and the, the, the knight in shining armor's <laughs> going this way and the, bunny, the guy in the bunny costume's going this way and the chorus girl's going that way. What about yeah. Trumbo? Sorry to interrupt, but what about, even though- They did their research. They did, I mean, okay, you yeah, feel that's- I'm, I'm, I mean, there's always going to, a screenwriter has to adapt the story to a certain degree. Now, it's up to the screenwriter and the producers how close to the truth they want to stay. These days, it's you're, the closer to the truth, the better, because you're going to get ripped to shreds. You know, back then, nobody really cared. You know, um, but um, and now and now, there's a lot more research available too. That is not just to the screenwriter who's writing the script, but to the people who are going to see the movie, and they're going to go, oh, let me find out about this guy. And so, you know, it's just like adapting a novel. You know, you, you, you are right, you're making a movie. This is the movie. This is not real life. You know, I'm sure Argo, um, the, the movie that, that um, um, Ben made, is there's, there's a lot that's not true about that story. The story is true. But, you're, but movies are entertainment. I mean, you could learn something from them, hopefully, uh, at times. But you're, you're, not, you're not telling the reality. That can be a documentary. And even those sometimes are, are twisted to, you know, documentaries are making somebody understand somebody's point of view about a story, right? But, um, you know, this is the job to make an, uh, something that entertains, whether it, whether it makes you laugh, make, makes you cry, scares you to death, you know, uh, just makes you feel good, whatever it is. And that's the job. And so, so it been the truth from time to time. <laughs> and so the reality for a working screenwriter is you may be hired you, uh, to, to write something. You may spend months on something, multiple drafts. You just get that one payment for completing the manuscript but then, or for the actual script, but then... Well, so it's usually several payments, but... Oh, it's, yeah. okay, so it's several payments, mm -hmm. and it's, okay, they give you for the first draft and right, then for revisions? Exactly. So okay. it's usually broken down like that, yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So you get the series of checks or whatever with the promise that maybe more will come if it's made, and then it's never made, it's not on your IMDb. Right. So... It'll be, in, it'll be in, in the contract that it'll say that the, um, the, the, the full amount based on the, on the, uh, the total budget uh, will be paid, um, it'll be this amount based on this budget, uh, and will be paid no, no later than um, first day of, of principal photography. So that's why, that's why we like the first day, first day of principal check. <laughs> it's very nice to get. Sure, but then continuing on knowing that that could be a reality, yeah. and that you won't always, I know you said with I Hate Kids, it sounds like just a magical, experience all in all in so many different parts of it. Yeah, yeah. And it may never mimic that for a lot of people, that yeah, yeah. warm, I, embracing, and look, you serendipitous. Know, I, I, I consider this, this, this crazy business, which I love, it, it's a house, it, always a house of cards. You can never tell when one little dink, a little card at the bottom of that thing is gonna be pulled out and then the whole thing comes crashing down. Uh, it happens all the time. So I always say, you know, look, nothing, nothing is real until it is. And that means going right up to, you can even be shooting a movie and it can be shut down. So 
uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy, crazy business. And uh, I love every minute of it. <laughs> Maintain what it is that the author was really trying to do with the story, like what, what, what he or she is trying to say in the overall, and try to stay true to the, to the basic beats of the story if you can. Sometimes you can't. Um, try to keep your characters true to the characters as they were defined in the story. But the trickiest part I've found, like I said I've done three of them now, is when a, when a story is written in the first person, meaning that you are, you are reading the, that person's thoughts, right, as that person is interacting with other people. And like in a, state, in a Stephen King novel, you know, like Pet Cemetery or, or The Shining, you're, you're hearing, uh, you know, Jack's thoughts as, he's, as his mind is deteriorating, right? So then the trick becomes, now you're going to turn that into a movie. How do you get that information out without having to do like a voiceover, like thinking kind of thing, which nobody likes, unless you're doing some like film noir kind of narration, right? Um, you have to find new and clever ways to get that information to the audience without it being too expositional, without it, um, uh, you know, like I said, without having a, a, a narration. You have to find more clever, you have to be clever about it. You have to find a way to say, how am I gonna get these thoughts out there so that it tells the story without it being distracting? So there was a lot of that in uh, the, last, uh, the last book I wrote, uh, the last uh, book I adapted. Um, there was a lot of that in, in Betsy Franco's uh, uh, book. So, um, so that's, that's the big challenge there. And I've actually come to really enjoy that challenge. You know, it was a little intimidating at first, when the, the first one I did, but now that I've done three of them, I'm kind of, I, I kind of get it and I kind of dig it and I, I'm not afraid of it. <laughs> How common is it for the actual author of the book to want you to adapt it rather than someone else saying, I really like this story, let's try to get the rights to it and adapt? Like which, which way happens more? The actual author of the book seeking adaptation or? You, no, usually the, um, uh, the author of the book will be offered an option uh, for a certain amount of time. Um, I, I, well, kind of like the studios do. The studios, you know, op will option a script for, you know, for two years or three years or something like that. In which case, they pay the, they pay the, the writer uh, a certain amount of money that will let them develop the project and potentially make the project in that time period. And if they don't make that movie in that time period, uh, they put it uh, in they, what they call turnaround, which means that they say, you know what, we decided we're not going to make this movie, so we're giving the rights back to you, you know, and you get to keep the option money. You don't have to give that back. But, but they're basically saying, you know, no, we, we decided to move on, et cetera. Um, Todd and I had that happen uh, with, um, with Woodstock. Woodstock, it's called. Um, Is it about Woodstock? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, it's a comedy about Woodstock. And um, so uh, 20th Century Fox optioned it. Um, um, and they optioned it for like, I think it was a year and a half or something like that to develop it. And they, they were trying to develop it and develop it. And I think Robert Duvall was attached at one point very briefly. And, um, but eventually, um, I, partly I think because it was a period piece in which were expensive. This is, this is before CG was available. Um, so it was quite a few years ago. Um, so eventually, um, they they put it in turnaround. They gave the rights back, and um, and which you know means that we could still bring that that uh, property to another studio, uh, and and have them option it and possibly make it. But will it happen? Probably not. <laughs> you know, especially if it's a script that's been around for a long time. It's it's a little harder. Um, but the difference is now that I, well. It would be a lot easier to make that movie now than then 
because because it's a period piece and it took place and the, the most of the movie takes place at the Woodstock Festival. Well, back then before CG, if you were going to make that movie, first of all, you need you know a hundred picture cars from 1969. You need thousands of extras stretched out over a huge area uh, to replicate the uh, you know the, the the hippies you know and everybody and then you need the stages with the bands right, right? and you need to pay for the music because it has to be the music That's from the true. festival yeah. right so that was an expensive endeavor no doubt and I think that's part of the reason they eventually turn, put it in turnaround. Nowadays, it'd be a lot easier because with CG, you don't need 100 picture cars. You need 10, and then the rest of them you fill in with CG. You may have them go back for miles and miles and miles. Oh. Same thing with the crowds. You have your hero hippies in the front, <laughs> and then you fill in the rest with, with CG characters because you can't tell that they're real or not. Do you um, need a Janis Joplin look like? Exactly. It's yeah. A, yeah, I mean that, and you need to what about her music? Well, I mean, music, I'm not even sure what she The music would still be expensive. Yeah, that's for uh -huh. sure. But um, and even if you did replicas of the music, you still have to pay for the rights. So you might as well get the real thing, right? That's um, oh, interesting. So, but um, and and the music is such an important part of the story. Um, in fact, we we utilized the music um, to actually represent what was happening in the dynamic between the family that were stuck there. That's what they, they were stuck there. See, oh, it's stuck. Yeah. So, um, um, great script. I got a lot of work because of that script. Again, oh. it was one of the one of the ones that people read as a sample and were like, "Oh, you're hired. That's great." You know. Um, so. Was it like a conservative family? Stuck? Yes. Oh, okay. Wow. That's... A, a retired, a re a retired <laughs> colonel. <laughs> so when his 16 year old crazy. daughter runs off into the into the festival to look for her boyfriend, he has to go after her. So for him, it's like going into enemy territory, <laughs> right? So there was a lot of great potential for humor there. Um, but um, but then Ang Lee made a movie about Woodstock, like I don't know, eight or nine years ago. Um, that did not do well. So we were like, well, we can't show it to anybody right now. Because <laughs> everybody was like, well, his movie did failed miserably. So which I, I'm not even sure if it failed miserably, but it did not do, you know, big numbers. So hmm. so, but you know, these this is what happens. <laughs> this is this is what it's like. Well, uh, and, and you know, thankfully my uh my lovely wife Leanne has been very patient with me and uh has um and she she's a a producer at Disney now, so she's doing fine. But she's always been um, very um, willing to let me pursue what I needed to pursue, which is which is great. So That's she's great. awesome. Nice. That sounds really funny. Yeah, a retired colonel. I, I, we love that script. <laughs> Todd and I always talk about. We'd love to be able to you know dust it off and put it out there again, and and you just got to wait for the timing to be right. You know what I mean? You know, also, you know, when you put a script out, every it goes out to everybody, right? For the most part. So everyone's reading. We had we had uh, Wood Woodstock was at CAA, and it went out, uh, you know, like with with a bunch of other scripts on the same day, and and we were we were um, uh, what do you call it? Um, we, um, I'm forgetting the word, but like we. we it was showing that we were doing really well. Like we were, we were expected to be the highest one that week, and it, and that's not what happened. <laughs> it it didn't. Uh, nobody bought it, and and then it sat around for like for like two years before 20th Century Fox um, uh, found a copy of it or was sent a copy or something, and and they read it and they said, oh, we well we like it, so we'll take it, and they they must have passed the first time around, but. But then you know you have turnover at the studios where, so the the, the executives who were there two years ago uh, are not there anymore, and there's new guys in, and maybe they haven't read that script. So, uh, you know, sometimes that's why some that's why a movie you know um, like Forrest Gump sometimes takes years and years and years and years to get made. It's because you got to have you've got to find the right person has to read it at the right time. Is that what happened, Eric Ross? Shopped it around for years. Oh yeah, from what I understand, I don't know the exact details of it, but it's kind of famously known that that the the movie was uh, uh, was out there years before and had been read all over town, and and 
you know, finally, um, it, it just took the right um, Robert Zemeckis and whoever else to, to champion it. Wow, who'd have thought? Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I always keep faith that, that uh, possibly some of those earlier scripts that we really loved so much might s still get made someday. Probably not, but it's possible. That's true. Yeah. Could King Kong have been written today and have been successful? I know you did a documentary mm -hmm. um, called Long Live the King. Yeah, Long Live the King. With uh, Trish Geiger in mm -hmm. 2016. But could that character have been effective if it had been written today? I Yes, because I think that is a character that there's, a, there's, there's, there's so many different levels of that character. There's so many different sort of classic t tropes in that character. It's so many different things. He's the, the, the king who falls from grace. He's, he's the fish out of water when he gets to New York. It's, it's unrequited love. I mean, all of those things are all part of King Kong. And, uh, you know, the original movie was, it was an epic film because the fact that movies weren't even around that long when it came out, and it's this massive, incredible feast for the eyes and the ears, and uh, and it, dinosaurs, and and you know, and Fay Ray, who's beautiful, whose daughter I'm going to meet tomorrow night. Nice. Um, and um, it, it's a timeless story. Now, you know, Peter Jackson had his version come out in 2005, and it was met with. Some people love it and some people hate it. Most of the people that hate it, hate it because of their love for the, for the original movie. And that nothing's ever going to compare to that. And actually, Peter even agrees with that. But, you know, he was, he was doing his version of it. Um, and I happen, myself, I happen to like it. Um, it's just a little long. <laughs> it's a little long. Um, uh, but, but I think that there's so many... Um, there's so many things about that story and about that character that resonate with people one way or another. And so I think that no matter when it would have been made, as long as it was made well, it would resonate with that era, without a doubt. 